I um, had not. Uh, I did basically no work to prepare for this, except for replaying through about half of the game. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> but I have played the game literally two hundred times. So, right. Uh, so you should be. be okay. You're you're well set. Yeah, you're well so, set. Yeah. You should be all right. Yeah. I've done no uh, revision for this at all. So. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, but you've I'm you. By our memory. The so. thing is, Laura, you've got a very particular pedigree here, haven't you? Because you actually dressed up. As a little did, sister yeah. at one I, point, did I you did not? I did do that. <laughs> and I made my own Adam syringe from scratch. Right? So. Yes. <laughs> nice. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> By the way, guys, I mean, generally how we, we tend to do this, we don't even tend to do an introduction. We tend to just start chatting and then um, it goes from there usually and spirals out in some very, very strange places, which I imagine it's going to do with this subject matter. <laughs> so if everyone's okay with that, we can just get on and chat, Yeah. Sounds yeah, good. good I just just let you know I need to run at seven because yep. I've got I'm packing for I'm I'm flying tomorrow. So right, I'm right. Manai for no problem. But if you but please you guys carry on if I have to run. Just, okay, just keep no just keep problem. on going. It's totally Not fine. A problem. Thanks so much, Laura. That should cool. be that should Thanks. be fine. Yeah. So guys. Bioshock. I mean, this is like, why is, Why do we always do this? Why do we always do this, Kit? We always pick like these huge, massive, resonant subjects that have no limits. They have no <coughs> containment whatsoever. I mean, if you're going to talk about Bioshock, then you can, or you, you can talk about its significance to video games, its cultural impact, Ayn Rand, obviously, if you want to go down that route, bloody hell. <laughs> um, do we ever want to go think, down that route? I think we are all objectivists, right? Like that's, uh, we all come from that particular political... <laughs> think you might be alone well, on and, that one, and, Daniel. Andrew Ryan did nothing wrong? Is that the uh... <laughs> I'm sure there's a movement out there. I'll bet you any money there's a video on YouTube called that somewhere. Oh, for sure. Oh, my well, God. If there's anything the rise of the alt-right has taught me over the last decade is there's nothing absolutely bloody stupid that the alt-right can't commandeer as its own, not realising it's taking the piss out of them. So, of course, <laughs> there's a absolutely. right did nothing wrong movement. Yeah. As soon as you say it, I believe it exists. With well, a, you know, it's a bullet board service and God knows what else. <laughs> Didn't Elon Musk recently... Uh, uh, paraphrase Andrew Ryan, except that he said he was going to Mars instead of building I, Rapture. Yes, was that parody or was that no, real? There was something, wasn't there? He said, I can't quite remember the exact quote, but it was something that was almost paraphrased from what Andrew Ryan says about Rapture in the opening dialogue of Bioshock. Yeah. Oh, you know, the whole, uh, who does this, does the sweat of your brow belong to you? No, yes, there's a man right. in Washington that belongs to the poor and all that yeah. business. Uh, uh, I, I feel like he did it completely unironically. Yeah. I think it was totally unironic. Whether he's actually played the game and it was just sort of surfacing, bubbling up in his memory without context, I don't know. But it's slightly frightening, isn't it, when you actually see real people who aren't a million miles removed from Andrew Ryan in terms of their status and their philosophy actually quoting this stuff. Yeah, and and, and not presumably not seeing the parallels. It's ironic, really, because, of course, Rapture was a colossal failure. That's the lesson yeah, that right. we take from Rapture, is that it was an enormous failure. So Elon Musk quoting it as though it's some sort of mission statement really misses the point. <laughs> it does a little bit. It does a little bit. If I may, though, it was a gorgeous failure. Yeah. Oh, if you get a fail, mm. fail spectacularly, right? I mean, you, it looks amazing. Well, you know, <laughs> even it's got a dilapidated state. It looks. Absolutely I mean, I, I'm let's playing it at the moment. It's uh, you can get it if you're on if you have like the PlayStation subscription. You can get it on the um, the PS system at the moment for free. Basically, it's the remastered versions. And I, I tell you, one of the big tensions I've had playing it this time is I hate it, but I love it. I hate it, <laughs> yeah. but I love it. Rapture is the most delectable, beautiful failure in imagination, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for me, the the obviously Bioshock is politically this fascinating, this incredible uh, political statement. It's brilliant. Well, but for me, it is uh, my, my, the big appeal of me is purely aesthetic. You know, yeah. the, the art, this kind of dilapidated art deco world that's kind of and what i love about art deco is art deco is so kind of harsh yeah right as it's an all, aesthetic anyway yeah it's very particular isn't it it's very sort of refined and synthesized down yeah and i think it's so easy for it to teach there's something because it's it's all straight lines and it's all mm. very geometric i think it's very easy for that kind of aesthetic to cross over into uncanny yeah and that's what you get in bioshock you get all of these you know these grand halls and this beautiful architecture but because it's so harsh and because it's so severe already when you take away the kind of the, the beautiful lighting and and, mm. and, and the, the cushioning of humans or you know of, of life you just get this kind of 
horrifyingly harsh you know this yeah. world and then you marry that to certain other aesthetics as well like the industrial factor yeah of rapture like when you actually reach ryan industries for example which is where ryan has his office which is essentially his lair it's his super villain lair isn't it if you were a bond <laughs> villain it's i mean even when it, the way it's presented in the game when you reach ryan industries you're, you're told to go to uh would you kindly go to ryan's offices and kill the bastard so you go <laughs> to ryan's office in inverted commas and it's like it's like this huge cathedral like space and you can see through the through the glass all of this polluted water and these mass massive industrial towers and there are wheels turning and cogs it's like office all right <laughs> <laughs> if you say so my dude right, yeah it is okay. yeah. <laughs> but, but don't uh, you get the impression that he just loved that view though Right. Don't you yeah. feel like that was like his dream fulfilled was to see that that oh, God, the, the machinery yeah. turning. You well, know? that's who if he you, is. If you it? read, if you read Ayn Rand, you know uh, mm -hmm. Rand definitely you know felt that way about. I mean, her her protagonists use that same kind of language that you know the 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 mountain itself is just this kind of ugly fact of life, but yeah. the ribbon of railroad that runs across the mountain transforms that mountain into something like lovely and gorgeous. That that man's right. industriousness itself is this, you know, um, thing that sort of, like, creates the beauty in the world. Uh, you get that definitely from reading um, Rand herself. Yeah, and that's, right. it's, it's something that comes <laughs> in the language of Bioshock as well. I mean, particularly in Andrew Ryan's speeches and soliloquies and whatnot, because actually you can tell how well-read the writers are in Bioshock, because the characters do talk like Randian characters. Yes. Andrew Ryan is the inversion of the protagonists from The Fountainhead and from Atlas Shrugged, essentially. They do talk like this. They have these long speeches that are very florid and very certain. That's the big thing in Randian characters. They are certain in their philosophy and it is all of this speechifying about um is a man not entitled to the sweat of his brow and so on and so <laughs> forth and railing against the systems that um effectively from a from an objectivist perspective curtail basic human freedoms and whatnot I always find is a man not such an interesting formulation too because it, mm. it reminds me of uh, neuro-linguistic programming mm. which often uses the technique of saying uh, the phrase that's really key in NLP is is it not mm. which is actually an impossible phrase to disagree with right mm. right if you think about it because how do you say no to is it not well that, that's yeah. a that's you know, a it's a clever technique that demagogues use in general isn't it and if Andrew well, Ryan is anything he's a demagogue Yes, I mean, and the first politician in real life I remember employing that rhetoric on a on a regular basis was Tony Blair, funnily enough, mm. who had clearly studied NLP and used, uh, well, it, the very you know in the day of his election he stood there a new dawn is is breaking, is it not? That mm. was his like you know, and I remember that even in in that moment I remember thinking, uh huh, he's mm. read the book, mm -hmm. and I, I find it very very interesting that that is something that's used that, that you're saying is common in the in the in the source language in the randian language um, oh that, it, it so rhetoric. is i mean it's it's one it's, of the things that it's it's very characteristic of Rand's writing, but it's also one of the things that when you read it and you're not already immersed in it, when you're not already identifying as an objectivist or whatever, it comes. It actually makes it ludicrous. <laughs> it, it, it makes it perfectly ludicrous because the characters, the, particularly the protagonists, the ones that, that Rand is trying to promote as, a, as heroic, um, it makes them absolutely ludicrous. It's interesting you put in your linguistic programming uh, and that particular phrase because... Um, arguably that's what Atlas is doing, isn't it? The entire uh, time with, with, you know, would you kindly? That uh, is, he yes. is neurolinguistic program, yep. isn't he? And and, and in in a similar way, would you kindly functions a bit like, um, is it not? Because yep. how can you argue with would you kindly? Well, you know, no, I won't kindly, but you, you're going to do it anyway, right? So <laughs> right, right. I mean, I, I will, but unkindly. That's yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. Like, you can't argue with it. Would you kindly as, as a phrase? So actually, it's fascinating. You put and. and it makes me wonder again how intentional was that it sh mm. surely it must have been well i mean it's such a i mean it's also one of those phrases would you kindly it's just such an innocuous phrase isn't it well yeah because yeah. you don't twig at all no. throughout you just think this is a guy who's genuinely got this crusade right. you know he's it's with his wife and kid isn't oh, it oh moira it's, and patrick yeah, yeah. moira <laughs> and patrick <laughs> which of course is the most stereotypical irish names you could have isn't right, it moira right. and patrick, so yeah well I mean, it, it plays into 
the Irish stereotype, I and mean, that's what's so brilliant about it, isn't it? Because it feels, it sounds like a colloquialism. It sounds like a, you know, it feels very much like a, an Irish, a warm Irish colloquialism. Yes. And the fact that you, I mean, the moment when you discover it's actually been the trigger phase for the entire game, which is also so smart because um, you do what he tells you to do in the game because you have to because you're in a first person shoot and you're on yeah. rail. You don't really have a choice, but no. one of the things I find so gobsmacking about it is the game retroactively gives you a reason why you never had a choice, yeah. which I just yeah. think is, how often does a game pull a trick like that? Well, it's very, very rare. This it's is very impressive. I mean, this is something I was really feeling with my, my most recent playthrough. It's been a, a long time since I played it, but this time around, it's how meta it is. It's how it sort of yeah. comments upon you as the player, because you as the player in this game, a lot of postmodern games, a lot of present day games are about giving you maximum choice maximum options so you can approach any situation in any way you like basically bioshock does the exact opposite it does the mirror opposite it takes away all agency from you so even when you feel like you're doing something that's a choice you're actually not the game is railroading you down a particular area what i love about it is it doesn't signify the would you kindly thing it doesn't signify it at all when it first occurs it's just a it's a mode of speech that atlas has and that's it that's yeah. it. It doesn't even feel... You don't even register it consciously. You don't register it consciously until the reveal, which is about two-thirds of the way through the narrative. <laughs> and it, when it hits... I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when it hit me for the first... By the way, massive spoilers, guys. We're going to assume you've played this game from 2005, okay? <laughs> if you got, haven't, tough. It's been, you know, the so, yeah. Yeah, 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 I mean, go oh, come on. Hit pause, go play it, come back. If you He's... haven't played it, you've encountered it in a meme somewhere, for God's That's sake. It's, it's like, it's part of video game culture, isn't it? It's part of video game history. It's like yeah. um, the cake is a lie. Or yeah. the, the fact that Aerith dies in Final Fantasy VII and you can't get her back. She's dead. Uh, <laughs> sorry, by the way, ladies and gents, if you haven't played any of those games or encountered <laughs> any of those memes. But, um, yeah, when you encounter the truth about Would You Kindly, and when that sets off the cascade of revelation about your past as a character, i.e. that everything you've believed up till this point, everything you've been introduced to, is a complete fabrication. It was, for me, this incredible moment. I don't usually like twists in storytelling, mm. certainly not that kind of twist. I tend to find that they are synthetic and they're badly handled, and once they're done, you can't really experience the narrative again. It's almost like um, mm. a one-shot narrative, you know? It's not the case here. It's not the case. When you've actually encountered that and you realize what the truth is, go back and play the game again. Go through like the first two thirds of the game and things that seemed really sincere and really profound take on this really sardonic tone. Like, you know when um, Atlas, there's an area, uh, Neptune's Bounty, where Atlas oh, tells you, God, yeah, yeah. he tells you to go, you've got to go to a submarine, you've got to save his, his wife and child, basically, Moira and Patrick, and you watch Ryan remotely blow up the sun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this, this strain of like violin music comes in and it's all very sad and it has incredible pathos but when you play it again it comes across as phenomenally sardonic yeah there's a there's a <laughs> bit of uh there's a bit of backstory there i don't know if you've ever actually gone down to the sub before you uh, trigger the fight oh i didn't know oh, you could new to me. Go. yeah because you, you can go down and you can, like, set up all the uh, all, uh, traps or whatever you want to do before, uh -huh. uh, you know, like, if you've played this game as many times as I have, then you've done just about everything <laughs> you can possibly do. But if you walk down there and walk next to the sub, uh, Atlas comes on the radio and says, like, can you hear, can you hear my wife and child in there? Can you hear them? Are they, are they okay? And you can't hear anything. Oh, right. oh my! I've <laughs> never encountered that that dialogue it's, before. It's 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 worth it's worth uh, doing that next time you you play through. That's uh, a lovely little Easter egg, isn't it? And it's it just it's that's what I like about Bioshock as a game. It's it's <laughs> it's so self aware and it 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 sets itself up like like you say when you when you play it a second time around, you with the knowledge of what's going to happen, it foreshadows it the whole oh, way. Totally it's just does. you don't know what the foreshadowing is. You don't right. see the foreshadowing. So you, you, it all, it obliges you to play through again because, of course, I mean, one of the things that is really impressive about Bioshock is that it does its foreshadowing and it sets up backstory in this incredibly clever way. It largely uses the environment because, yeah. of course, you're you're dropped into the narrative halfway through. It's an in media res story technically. You you are dropped 
stopped yeah. in after the main conflict the 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 descent of rapture into anarchy the uh the influence of fontaine the civil war between fontaine and ryan all that's over it's yeah. all done and rapture's just in ruins as a result of it so you're dropped into the story and have to sort of piece it together from environmental details and little bits and pieces and the game does it in the most beautiful way imaginable most of the time the storytelling doesn't occur through exposition it doesn't occur th even through like the bits of dialogue that you find like the audio logs and whatever yeah it occurs just through little environmental details that you find like when you when you first wander into rapture one of the first things you find is a basically a crucified corpse it's up on like a big pillar and it says something like um smugglers is smeared yeah that's the beginning the... of neptune's bounty that's it yeah and underneath it you can see what he was smuggling there are there's a suitcase open and there are bibles and crucifixes and things in it so <laughs> you can you infer from that so so much about the tensions yeah. that are happening in this city it's so bloody clever and what I like about it is, you, so you've got the, as you, as you point out, the sort of the the civilian tensions, the tensions mm. between the between the people in the city. But you've also got this very sitting alongside it, this very unreal world. Because then, what well, I, well, I think, if I recall correctly, one of the first things you see when you come off the bathosphere is a little sister mm. uh, hanging over a corpse. No, it's hanging over your corpse. Isn't yeah, it? Or your, it's your, you know, your corpse, your yeah. body. She yeah. says. Uh, Oh, it's an angel. Uh, uh -huh. Oh no, this, this one's not ready yet, Mr. Bubbles. You know, he has to. He, <laughs> he'll be ready soon. And then she just trundles off, and this big yeah. daddy trundles off, and you realise that there's something really wrong. Yeah. So you've got this this very um, human kind of conflict between Fontaine and and Ryan. And then on the other hand, you've got this complete chaos of these not quite human, this mm. uncanny. I think what I, what I love about Bioshock is is the uncanny element of it because yeah. it is it is so uncanny. It's it's a city. But it's underwater. So right, you're yeah. walking through what could be 1920s New York, you know, these these theatres and these... And then you look out the window and there's fish. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you go, you, you, you go through you go through this, this uh, you know, like like the marketplace and then you're in a tunnel and all around, there's water all around you. Right, it's, right. It's, you know, so they've got the environmental uncanny for a start. Yeah. But then you've also got the uncanny populace. You've got the splices who are the mm -hmm. ultimate... You know, it, it, objectivism kind of taken to its... To, uh, to its extreme, you know, yeah. if you do anything you want to your body, then at what point do, do you, you stop? Exactly. Yeah, and also, at what point are you still human? Yeah. You know, if you're literally altering your your own DNA, your own gene code, then at what point are you human? At what point are you not? And I think there's also that central conflict of um, when you, when you kill the splices, is, is it is it you know yeah. is is it murder or is it, mm. is it is, putting down almost yeah because also you've got this the, the, the you see it's interesting about choices because you have got one choice kind of which does influence the ending and that's whether you harvest or whether yeah. you yep. free the little sisters and that's yep. really interesting to me because when i first played that game I, I couldn't bring myself to harvest them because to me they were clearly little girls yeah right <laughs> children but of course there, there are rewards to harvest in them. So the game asks you to kind of make a philosophical choice at that point as well. Yeah. So it's not just it, you, you talk about it being meta. It is meta because you're you're actually being immersed in the game world as a player, having to make choices within that game world. Mm -hmm. Now, can I ask a question about that? This is more of a, on the side of the mechanics, but I'm genuinely interested. Yeah. I've I've never done a playthrough where I've harvested. I just haven't been able to bring myself to do it so it sounds like from what you're saying i mean i imagine for starters the end would be different the, i think yeah, it would there have are to be two <clears throat> different endings to the game yeah. okay yeah but but my other question was so you said it's it's more rewarding now i know that the guy tells you if you don't harvest you'll get less adam yeah when you when you do it which is fine but i also know that if you keep not harvesting you get these extra presents that's mm -hmm. right there are certain benefits to not harvesting because right. of course you have tenenbaum the... who is the um sort of the mother of the the little sister she's the uh the scientist who has a very yeah. interesting background she was actually a prisoner of war in um uh, world war was it World War Two Germany, I believe? She it was, was in the concentration yeah. camps. Right. Um, right. And she mm -hmm. is the one who comes up with the notion of utilising the little sisters, of creating them to sort of... Um, to making them little atom factories, basically. She's the one who comes up with all of that, but has a change of heart during the process and is now very maternal, very protective of them. There's actually some very... Uh, Tenenbaum's one of the most interesting characters in it because she yes. actually has this arc going on where right. the, the first order 
audio logs you find of her are just they're very technical she's talking about how ad like a lot of characters are they talk she talks about the potential of adam she talks about how it's it's the it's the atom bomb times uh emc mm. uh, mm. you know it, it's every revelation in human history essentially wrapped up in one and then taken to the power of n it changes everything it changes yeah everything and she's interested in the potential of it but it's not until later that she starts to feel what she describes as a weakness she actually describes it in her audio logs as a something she doesn't like feeling this maternal instinct and that's right. when it changes for her that's when she becomes the the protectors of the little sisters because of course she feels guilt she feels terrible mm. for what she's done to them but there are benefits, so, yes. There are benefits. They, yeah. uh, they leave you... The little sisters, if you save them, Tenenbaum will help you, for one thing. Yeah. Tenenbaum will help you throughout the game. And the little sisters will um, crop up every now and then to leave you presents of plasmids that you wouldn't otherwise get in the game. Um, and also just little, you know, little uh, disposables um, and things like that. So I guess because I think I think my question was so that's interesting. So if you if you go the if you go the save route rather than the harvest route, you end up with plasmids you wouldn't otherwise get. So is it true actually then that if you harvest, you do get more atom overall, and that's the trade off that you're making? You do get more overall. It's not that right. much more. I have I have okay. again played this game many many times. <laughs> that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Almost every playthrough, I do the saving the sisters option. Uh -huh. Right. Um, it is actually the better way to play it. It is an easier yeah. game. If you, uh, ironically, it is actually easier to save rather than harvest. Yeah, interesting. Um, although you get uh, more immediate rewards from harvesting. Yeah, yeah it's uh, like an instant gratification thing, isn't it? So you only get the rewards after every three sisters that you save. Mm -hmm. um, you get almost as much atom because the rewards come with 200 atom, and you're losing 80 each time you don't, because you get 160 atom if you yeah. harvest versus 80 if you save, right? So if you do the math on it, you end up with slightly less atom, so you can't buy as much stuff. Mm -hmm. But they also give you like ammunition in some of them. You get... Uh, uh, plasmids you're not going to get. In the very first reward, you get the hypnotized big daddy plasma, which, which is incredibly is useful oh, in so um, various useful. places of the game. Um, in particular, the uh, the big fight um, after you uh, the, the big fight in um, uh, what's her name Langford's office. Oh, that. Um, oh, yes, <clears throat> where you're locked in essentially. Well, you're locked in and basically just like let the big daddy fight all the Houdini yep. splicers for you. That's it. Yeah. So, okay, so if, if you have questions about the mechanics of the game, believe me, I am. But I mean, it's also I did I did take the moment to Google, um, you know, Andrew Ryan did nothing wrong. Which oh, first of all, auto completed. Oh God! Form. First of all, yeah, auto completed. Complete, that's a bad <laughs> sign. <laughs> and the very first link in my incognito window was to a Reddit post called "Was Andrew Ryan Right?" Oh, wow, it would be very wow. something like uh, well, it has about thirty comments. So oh, okay. uh, yeah, uh, it's it, people are arguing in the comments. Let's right. put it that way. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there do seem to be some people who are kind of more on the like, well, people should be entitled to their own labor, but also uh, some people have more money than others, etc. So it's not complete right wing dipshittery. Oh, but, um, <laughs> so. well, that's something I actually I did want to talk about, and I know this is something that gets developed more in the second game, but it is there very much in the first, and it's something actually I've been thinking about in terms of wider political discourse right now, mm. and that's the the language of parasitism and the mm. parasite. Right, because it's a it's a phrase, it's a you know it's a, it's a concept that has a very freighted history. Of course, Daniel, yeah. with his, with your background in in studying the alt right and understanding the history, of this you'll you'll immediately. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what's going on? I mean, alt right? What, um, what on earth are you talking about, kid? So you know the the notion of the notion of the parasite um, is is something that's very very kind of I mean intrinsically part of of, uh, of Nazi propaganda. You know the image of the Jew as parasite in that yeah. case is something that's very strongly built in. Interestingly, the the language of parasitism is also in some forms of communism and certainly in Stalinism it was also used uh, often to mean different people. And I just found it very I just found it really interesting that it that it crops up again. And and I found that, that that Ryan's particular version of what the parasite was felt to me particularly ill-defined somehow, which I found really interesting um, because it's like you know he's talking about government, but it's like well, but you, Rapture does have 
governance. It is mm-hmm. governance. Yeah. You have yeah. laws. You have rules. You have right. so, you know what? And it's almost like his definition of the parasite shifts depending on who he's pissed off within a given moment. That's and I just true. <laughs> and I thought that was really. I just thought it was really interesting. That's all because it, it is language that I see an awful lot. And I have to say, it is. I'm not normally one of those both siders, but I have to observe. I see people on the left use the language of parasitism often to describe you know, the upper echelons of the capitalist mm-hmm. class. So they'll talk yes. about billionaires as parasites. Mm-hmm. That's language you will hear on the left. I just found it really interesting that it was it was such a strong... And, and you know, Ryan's really insistent about it. You know, he yeah. almost spits the word whenever he says it, and he says it a lot. Um, I don't know. I just wonder what you what you all feel has, about that. Has anyone here, is anyone here, like, deeply familiar with Ayn Rand's work? Like, I was a I was a teenage libertarian, so, like, right, it was so Ayn you, Rand and Robert Heinlein. Right, were, you know, so you were well like, into it, yeah? I was very I, yes. I have read the Fountainhead many many times. <laughs> uh, you know, not for not for decades. So mm. like, I will get details wrong, but yes, right. I was I was I believed this shit at some point in my life. Right. So I don't know if anyone else had that experience as well. No, didn't believe it. I've read the books. I've read them, okay. but I was I was sort of past my my teenage years when I read them. And I also I believe I may have already played Bioshock by the time I came across. Um, the original uh, Atlas Shrugged so I'm familiar with the stories I'm familiar with what Ayn Rand believe I've watched interviews with the woman and read her wider works and um, yeah it's and also yeah. I work in social I... care so you know it's <laughs> I'm, I'm I am enemy number one insofar as Ayn Rand is concerned well, the Ayn Rand like foundation or whatever the objectivist whatever they call their their uh, presumably a nonprofit organization, mm-hmm. which is amusing, um, actually <laughs> runs a uh, like an essay writing contest among high schoolers, uh-huh. and uh, you know so so like uh, it's like a thousand dollar scholarship or whatever. At least they uh-huh. did back in the nineties when I was in high school, and so you would get these like flyers. It would be like, oh, you're a bright kid. You should uh-huh. like read Anthem, and then you should read The Fountainhead, and then write right. a a, a book on it, and in fact, Anthem was one of our like summer reading list books right. uh, for uh, my uh, my uh, freshman year of high school. So, uh, you know, this there is an actual like propaganda effort meant to like kind of you know inculcate uh, inculcate uh, kids with this or teenagers with this. Um, and I kind of fell deep into the Fountainhead uh, yeah. <laughs> in my like tenth grade year, um, and then eventually read Atlas Shrugged. I don't think I ever finished We the Living. I think I was kind of getting out of it by then, yeah. but. Like you know, uh, I was I was into it. So um, just thinking about the term parasite, there's this thing that Ellsworth Tui has in uh, the Fountainhead where he talks like incessantly about the second handers. Yeah. Um, and that the the second handers are people who uh, don't uh, draw their like life's meaning or their kind of like meaning of of, of life from um, the things that they actually do in the world, but from mm-hmm. the good feelings that others have for them. Yeah. Um, you would call it virtue signaling today. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, you know, uh-huh. it's, um, <laughs> it's a very similar kind of concept. Um, and that even the like being uh, altruistic, that even like giving to the poor is ultimately like I'm making myself feel good mm-hmm. by giving to the poor. And oh, Ellsworth yeah. Tui is someone who is like uh, in the in the confines of the novel, explicitly sort of using this ideology of altruism which he in the novel knows is incorrect and knows is not actually it's actually poison Mm -hmm. like he's a deliberate villain not like a misguided person um because um it's impossible to be like (laughs) you know authentically misguided in in the ayn randiverse yeah (laughs) like you're either an abject villain or you are uh, are one of the one of the ubermensch that's uh, right you're a hero (laughs) you are a very almost classical hero aren't you you know right right um, but yeah, no, the, 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 the language of secondhanders and the language of, of that uh, lines up, I think, with Ryan's kind of image of the parasite as it's, as it's used. It's, just, it's A, it's used just anyone who kind of pisses Ryan off. Yeah. Like, the only reason you would possibly do that is if you're a parasite, like, trying to, like, leech off of my productive energy, oh, um, right. which is a very kind of Randian, um, Ubermensch hero type of thing to say. Um, so there is this kind of, like, personality defect element to it. Um, but certainly, like, uh, the way that it's used there and the way that it's used is sort of, like, the only reason anyone would possibly um, disagree with uh, my attitudes towards this is because they are trying to 
leech off of me, and therefore they are a they are parasite, parasite like second-hander, just... right? You know. Right. And it's ironic, isn't it? I mean, the game throws up this wonderful irony in the sense that initially Ryan dismisses Fontaine as a parasite. He calls him a thug with vision, I believe, at one point. Um, which And the irony, of course, by objectivist terms, Fontaine is the legitimate heir of Rapture. Well, exactly. He, he screws them all over. He demonstrates his superiority <laughs> over all of them, does he not? Consistently. Well, I find- I find it interesting because it, Ryan's own uh, his own um, ethos is uh, it, it's the principle that he quotes a few times is a man chooses a slave obeys right, right, says, right that comes up a few times and yeah as you say by by Ryan's own logic Fontaine deserves yes to take over he 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 it's his industry and his you know the sweat of his brow mm-hmm. ironically that yep. places him in that position so it's. And, it, and it, I think it does it does expose a certain truism in that when you get these kind of extreme political views, the, the, the lack of consistency, mm-hmm. uh, the the kind of the positioning of who is the enemy shifts depending right. on where they are to you. And yeah. that's exactly what Ryan is doing, I think, with Fontaine. Yeah, it's so interesting, the dynamic between Ryan and, and Fontaine, because it does expose a real problem at the heart of objectivism, which is that there's always someone with a better mousetrap, yeah? So yeah. you are in a state of constant Darwinian one-upmanship. And the irony of... Uh, I mean, you actually find at several points there are um, the audio logs from Andrew Ryan. And he talks about what Fontaine and Tenenbaum are doing together, which is the, the harvesting of the atom, the creation of the... Uh, the cornering of the market in genetic splicing, essentially, in Rapture. And Ryan, despite his, self, his proclamation of having this incredible vision, dismisses it. Yes. He regards it as a sort of flash in the pan, something that won't sustain, and so he ignores it. He lets them get on with it. He doesn't have the vision that this thug with a brain does. He doesn't see what Fontaine does. And in the same vein, you will find audio logs later on when it's revealed that Fontaine is still around and that you know he was atlas and whatnot um you actually find these audio logs where fontaine talks about when he discovers what adam is when tenenbaum explains to him what this stuff can do he he sees in a way that ryan doesn't he he has the imagination to see what this stuff can do he realizes that everything he's been trying to do all of the big cons that he's been involved in over the years are nothing compared to this he it re it rearranges his perspectives on power and on possibility he actually wants to be another order of being through the adam which is p- possible it is actually yeah. potentially t- he takes the argument to almost metaphysical levels whereas ryan doesn't Ryan is still locked in to this very narrow, conservative sort of myopia, this objectivism that he just cannot see beyond, he cannot put down, despite the fact that by his very position, by the, by the failure of Rapture, it has been exposed. It has been exposed as illegitimate. You're kind of tapping into something that bothers me a lot about contemporary, and I know Bioshock isn't cyberpunk, really. Although, I mean, I suppose it could it be. Has, it sort of has elements it, it, it's of kind the of a cyberpunk, retro, doesn't it? Yeah. A retrospective cyberpunk, in yeah. a way, isn't it? Because if, if you were to take it of its era, let's say you were actually existing in, I don't know, 1900, mm-hmm. and to look forward to 1950 and to see Rapture, that yeah. would, I, I guess, from that perspective, it's cyberpunk. But um, to, what you're saying there is really interesting. So, what, something that bothers me about cyberpunk, particularly in this day and age, as it's made, is how limited our imagination is with mm-hmm. cyberpunk so when you posit a cyberpunk future you're positing a future in which and rapture does this with with adam and plasmids and and mm-hmm. splicing that we are effectively in control of our own bodies right we right. can do whatever we want with our bodies that's that's the cyberpunk future that's yeah. the and you know and i guess also you can bring objectivism into this because you know it's it's the, the total control the sense yeah. of what is you know what is good for the individual so what is good for me what is good mm-hmm. for my body and yet, in these worlds, it the, there's still rigid binary mm-hmm. genders. Yep. Mm. Um, disability and mm-hmm. illness are still still exist. Um, and you just think, 
you know, realistically, lo- looking from a 2020 perspective, you know, as in 2020 the year and not 2020 vision, yeah. or, or, or both. <laughs> yeah, right. It works both um, ways, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, in a cyberpunk future, are we really going to be... Is it going to look the same as it does now just with a few add-ons you know right. is that really the limits of our imagination it's the same problem in rapture, in rapture yeah so yeah. What, you, what you've got is the when you introduce the notion of adam i mean there are a few characters who do see the potential of it tenenbaum does at one point there yes. is a very early audio log where she talks about how you can uh, no it's not tenenbaum it's actually steinman you know the surgeon from the medical tenenbaum has one too but yes it's he talks about how what all of the the factors by which we traditionally identify that history and by the the contexts that are imposed upon us by history by biology by geography they can be undone by adam yeah. so you can change your gender your sex your race you can you can actually transcend the parameters of humanity but it's ironic isn't it that they characters have had these revelations they have actually had these moments of incredible almost transcendence where they've seen what the adam can do and th- that that potential is legitimate it is there but they haven't put it into practice yeah Instead, what they've done is concentrated on these very myopic, very aesthetic changes, particularly with Steinman. I mean, his whole thing is aestheticism, obviously, taken to the most absurd extremes. Um, But he hasn't done what he proclaims he was going to do. It's almost gone the other way. Uh, That's really fascinating to me. It's very dystopian. Very dystopian. Isn't it? Doesn't at least part of that come from the inherent flaw of the location, though? I mean, it seems to me that one of the things that I find most mind-boggling and amazing about Rapture is the is the very isolation of it. Yeah. You know, it's it's the bottom of the ocean, which means that it's inherently you're surrounded by a by an environment that's inherently utterly hostile right to to land-based life right you're surrounded by death literally you're surrounded mm-hmm. by cold death which you know is 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 slowly but surely eating away at the walls of uh, at the walls well, of the city let's just say it's a society under tremendous pressure you know you, you know Daniel, There's always you, one, Daniel. There's you say always it one. as a joke but you know it, it yeah. is true as well isn't it i mean I'm, i imagine part of the metaphor is exactly that you know it yeah. is this highly pressurized environment not only that it's a closed system yes that's it's the a, point uh, i was getting to is it exactly that it's a closed system because of that i mean we know what happens to genetic groups where you don't mm. actually where, where things get too insular right right i mean it, it gets really things get really bad really quickly mm-hmm. yeah. um you you need diversity in order to flourish for any species of any kind to flourish you need yeah. you need actual you know you need quite a lot of diversity quite yeah, a lot right. of biological diversity i think that part of what's going on in rapture is that part of what's being posited there is that the same is true of ideas Mm -hmm. and and culture yeah you actually need you need you need multiculturalism you need that collision of cultures you need all those ideas bouncing off each other and rubbing up against each other to create new ideas otherwise if you're all stuck with far too many clearly the people who have been selected to join rapture yeah you know fit within some very very narrow parameters in certain ways yeah. and, and clearly, you know in terms of assumptions about gender roles is clearly one of the ways in which they're very narrow then you you don't have the imagination you know the the, the critical mass of imagination the critical mass of different ideas necessary yeah. to make the leaps you're talking about so while adam has that potential it's limited by the the pool of the self-selected pool of people who aren't you know don't have enough between them don't have enough capacity yeah. imagination to to make those breakthroughs manifest yeah, yeah I, I think you're absolutely right there. there's an inevitable entropy isn't there as there is with yeah. any yeah. within any closed system you know whether you're referring to physics biology or indeed ideology the tensions that necessarily result in new ideas um, in new perspectives and new ways just aren't there and that's i think that is it's emphasized and escalated to the power of n by the fact that it's founded on objectivism because objectivism <laughs> is such a narrow and myopic um, a, i hesitate to call it a philosophy because it's not really um, a coherent philosophy but it it's such a narrow and necessarily narrow and myopic um ideology that it clo- it actually ignores wider context and you actually see this in the game as well you actually see this in the game there's a a point in i think it's on the arcadia 
level where you come across the synthetic forests that have been created in Rapture to sustain the, the oxygen supply, basically. And Ryan comes over the radio and he says, he, he sells you this entire spiel about how on dry land, when he was an industrialist, he purchased a forest. He purchased an area of forest land, which the government then declared that he couldn't have because it was public land. And so in order uh, to make his point, he burned it down. Rather than open it to the public, he burned it down. And that's exactly what he tries to do here. He basically filters in all of this toxic gas to kill the trees, which would eliminate Rapture's oxygen supply. So rather than allow you... At this point, he believes that you're a CIA agent or a KGB agent. You've come to, to ravage Rapture, to take its secrets and whatnot. So rather than allow that to happen he would destroy the entirety of Rapture. Um, and it really does demonstrate what... It, it demonstrates just how narrow and closed off objectivism is, doesn't it? It really does. Because, oh, it's certainly that particular pers form of objectivism that Ryan represents. It's su he's, such a, he's such a wanker, basically. <laughs> the man is, is such it, a wanker. The irony is, what is he trying to protect? Because it's right. already destroyed at this point. That's the point. Uh, that, yeah, that's it. Rapture is already... It's already a, a, a shambles. It's, it's, it's right. a shell. It's, there's nothing left for him apart from... The the, the the genesis of his ideas, which have, have fallen to dust in, in yeah. any case, you know, you, it, it's Ozymandias, isn't it? Look at yeah. my work, you mighty in despair. It's, it's absolutely. There's nothing mm. left. But he won't and have yet, it. He won't have no. it. Either. You know, he still thinks that Rapture is. He's, he's he, holding he just, on to something that yeah. demonstrably is not there. Yeah, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely I mean, true. From 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 Ryan's point of view, we're only a few months into this, you know, sort of revolution. Like he still sees it as like I'm battling Fontaine and Atlas, who he doesn't realize are the same person. Right. Um. And and you know, I'm just gonna stave off this revolution and then rebuild. I mean, he sees it as a as as a battle for, um, you know, control as a battle of for the control of this revolution from below. Um. I found it interesting that Atlas. I mean, there there is a, a you know a socio political read here that Atlas is uh. You know whether whether Atlas the myth or Fontaine the reality is actually doing something uh, arguably good in the sense of uh, organizing the the uh, poverty stricken classes right. on Olympus Heights and mm -hmm. uh, Apollo Square, right? Um, he is sorry, Olympus Heights is the, are the wealthy people. Apollo mm -hmm. Square is where the where the uh, poverty ridden people live. Yeah. Um, and you know, walking through that environment after Olympus Heights is a pretty fascinating uh, experience. I could talk about any particular level in this game for as long as I think you all would want to discuss the entire Likewise. game. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. There's, there's just there's so much going on, isn't there? I mean, it's not just yeah. like the ideological resonances it's the you know it's it's the the shifting aesthetics the tone of the game as well i mean i did you daniel did you ever play system shock i never played system shock i was never a big gamer um i kind of got a 360 um in like 2008 or maybe 2009 um and uh, a guy i knew was kind of like oh yeah i'm kind of bioshock is a game you should definitely play because you're interested in philosophy and yeah. you know that sort of thing and i'm like oh yeah sure and never really was it you know it was kind of one of the first games i i played oh wow uh, you know except for you know like like lego star wars and that sort of thing <laughs> right, which, you know, right. Like, um you know uh, it's like that and dead rising are kind of the two games that i kind of <laughs> got like super into and just like kind of played over and over and over right. again um i went through a brief period of kind of getting into like playing games but i mean again you want to talk about the history of video gaming i'm like i got nothing guys. <laughs> 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 right, okay. uh, you know i'm you know i played super mario brothers as a kid <laughs> <laughs> right well i mean uh, I loved System Shock 2, which was released in, uh, I think, 2000 or 1999, is very much the, the the mother and father of Bioshock. It's the same creative team. It's Ken Levine and Irrational Games. And Bioshock is essentially, I mean, it's not, it's not a criticism of the game, but it is essentially just an updated skin of System Shock 2. The mechanics are all the same. They're all the same. It's um, it's the same sort of commingling of RPG and um, first-person shooter elements. But what really strikes me is, is that playing Bioshock after playing System Shock 2, you can see the... I mean, System Shock 2 is much more of a sort of science fiction horror game than Rapture is. It's much more focused on the horror element. It has a sort of Cronenbergian body horror element about it. But you can see that. You know, the horror set pieces that crop mm. up throughout Bioshock. I mean, one of, one of my... Particularly in the medical pavilion, oh, which is really aggressive. Yes. 
Yeah. It's nasty. <laughs> my, one of my favourite moments is that in the medical pavilion is when you enter the dental area and all the smokes, just the steam just spews into the room. <laughs> and when you turn round, there is a splicer, a medical splicer stood right in front of you. And he does nothing. He just stands and stares at you until you hit him, basically. Yeah. It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, yeah. Can, how can something not doing something be so terrifying? And yet, it, it, you know, oh, you're totally right. That, that bit in the game mode, I, oh. I remember this. What is it doing? What is yeah. it doing? It's gonna move. It's gonna move. It's gonna, and you know, you've got a good two minutes of waiting for it to do something, and then going towards it. But ah, <laughs> well, you can see it. And again, like, and again, just on a just on a mechanic level, if you don't pick up that tonic that's sitting right there, he doesn't appear even. Right? Really? Does he not? Oh, he that's doesn't. No. That's he very only cool. he is triggered because you pick up that tonic, and then you get like another dose of the the steam, and then you turn around and he's standing right there. If you don't pick up that tonic, he doesn't appear. Right. It's oh, it's the passivity of it that creeps me out. It's well, the it's the same that, as oh. the big daddies, isn't it? Because yeah. the big daddies don't actually do yeah. anything unless yeah. you threaten the little sisters. Yeah, but yeah. the sheer presence of them is enough to terrify the life out of you because yeah. they're so anomalous and so like you look at them and you go, okay, those things are dangerous. Yeah, they're the <laughs> he's most. He's on his arm. He's gonna, he's gonna hurt me. But they don't hurt you unless. You trigger it, no. which is fascinating to me. Uh, and it's it does it, again. It's a meta commentary on video games, isn't it? Particularly yeah. first-person shooters, because they, mm. you know, up till that point, really. I mean, most people don't. I mean, now it's hard to imagine because a lot of first-person shooters do this now. But back then, the notion that you might not want to kill something in a first-person yeah. shooter was way out there. Yeah. I always thought it more interesting. I'm I mean, a big fan of to... games that have what, what you call the pacifist run, and I think. Oh, sorry. Oh no 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 not at all not at all go ahead. No, I'm just saying things like so like Metal the Metal Gear Solid series is a really good example of this because you know it, theoretically throughout most of the games, especially um the third, Metal Gear Solid Three, you have the option of playing that entire game without killing anybody. Yeah. You know, in Metal Gear Solid Three, you can even the bosses you can what they call stamina kill them, which means that yeah. you know you just you just knock them out basically. <laughs> and the game itself has this mechanic where so one of the bosses is a powerful medium, and you meet him at some point in the middle of the game and if you've killed soldiers you have to then walk through this river with the ghost of every soldier that you've killed comes at you and it's nice. shit scary it's genuinely terrifying it's, it's a real but it's it's not just an effective horror set piece it is confronting you the gamer yeah. with the with the consequences of your choice yeah and that's think, really effective i think dishonored's got a similar mechanic i think dishonored yeah. you can complete the game without yes, killing that's right yeah there's a, there's a trophy for it if I remember it's right. become much more common hasn't it i mean deus ex yeah. i mean if you want to look oh yeah, yeah the game that really i mean i think the one that probably made it it brought it really shrieking into the mainstream is probably the original deus ex because you can mm. do more or less that entire game i think there are one or two characters that you actually have to kill because of the story but for the most part, you can do an entire pacifist run of that game. And I think it may have been one of the very first first-person games where you can do that. Right. Yeah, I think you might be right. Now, obviously, you can't do that in Bioshock. It would be... I'm sure people have tried. <laughs> I think I, I, well, no, I, lo I love how the Bioshock version of that is you do the wrench run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, go yeah. In, you go all melee. And you that's go like... tech, yeah. Well, that's, that's one of the interesting I, I actually areas. do play primarily with the wrench. That's that's my. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so, is there a specific. So what's the plasmid build you go for then if you're going for a wrench run? Uh, oh, I was I was going to do Ludo narrative first, but we can talk about like mechanics of the uh, gameplay if you like. Um, I was interested in this in this uh, kind of question of the sort of the, the moral system of um, who you kill because I do think that there is this if if we're going to criticize the game, um, and I think it's worth criticizing the we've built this kind of amazing like kind of complicated world full of like this kind of philosophical conundrum. Um, and the way that you mainly interact with it is by like walking up to things and hitting them and in the head with the bench, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, you know, there's this guy. You just have to. Be, am I gonna burn this guy alive, or am I gonna like send a send a security <laughs> yeah. after him? Like, yeah. You know. You're really not, you know, it does. There, the, Roger Ebert famously had this, uh, you know, kind of thing. Video games can't be art, which is obviously nonsense. But I think he had a point of, you know, the the way that we typically interact with these things is like there's a bunch of zombies and there's a score counter in the bottom, and you get, you know, and uh, 
you know, what are we really, no matter how sophisticated the thing that we're doing is, ultimately it's just kind of about, like, kind of overcoming this challenge. Uh -huh. And obviously, I mean, he's obviously wrong there. I'm not arguing that he's right, but I think that's kind of, I think the more subtle point that he was trying to make and kind of in this uh, slightly uh, simplistic way gets uh, overlooked um, yeah. around that conversation. I think Bioshock is a perfect example of that. I mean, every first-person shooter <laughs> that I've ever played, the every protagonist of one of these games is one of the world's greatest serial killers. Yes, that's, you it's know? Like, absolutely true. It's the absolutely number of, true. And, and so, like, the question of, like, well, do you harvest or do you save the sisters is kind of like, well, do you murder the small children or not? It's not, like, a yeah, sophisticated yeah. moral question. No, not um, so. Particularly when the game literally gives you more rewards uh, for uh -huh. uh, saving them than it is harvesting them. I do, I was you know, on this kind of recent replay, and as I was thinking about it, I was like, wouldn't it be interesting if... Um, you didn't have to uh, fight the big daddy if you harvested right. the sister. Yeah. Like if you could, if if it's like okay, here's this thing you can kind of like take the sister and harvest her. The daddy won't notice you if you do that, but if you try to like rescue her, then like the protective mechanism comes in yeah. or something like that, you know. Um, and you don't get the rewards or something like that, you know, for for and so so you know you you get to choose like the big daddy fight becomes the thing that you're either trying to avoid or not because you have to fight the daddy regardless. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you want the sister. Um, and uh, just uh, one brief thing just about the presence of the daddies in the game without the sisters means that you have to be much more circumspect about like what kind of like area effect uh, mm. damages you kind of lay down. Oh, yes. And like, you really have to be careful because of their, especially if you don't kind of, if you haven't memorized the game yet. Not that I've memorized the game. I mean, <laughs> or anything um, like that. If you don't know exactly which daddy is triggered at which particular point, um, you know you don't necessarily know. Um, you know you can't just go in and like spray a bunch of like machine gun rounds around, you know that sort of thing. So yes. I, the, it, it provide it creates this. Um, the, the makers of the game describe some of the plasmas, like the security bullseye or the like hypnotizer and rage, uh, describe these as ecology plasmids. And I think there's something really interesting there where the way that you interact with the game is through kind of manipulating the quote unquote ecology of the way that the things around you work uh -huh. as opposed to directly fighting them. Um, and so, like, sending like security bots to kill a big daddy for you. So you don't have to, like, because you can trigger uh, a security alarm and then throw the security bullseye at the Big Daddy. Mm -hmm. And if you're kind of clever about it, there are places in the game where that's absolutely the most efficient way to kill the Big Daddy. Oh, you totally, know? yeah. Um, you know, um, and, and using, like, Enrage or using the Hypnotized Plasmas and that sort of thing. Oh, Enrage um, it, is my go-to plasmid. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, I, actually, I actually don't use Enrage that much until I get towards the end of the game and it becomes wow. super cheap. And I just sort of buy it. My, I use telekinesis. I use the electro bolt, and I use the um, target dummy. Um, target dummy is my uh -huh. bane um, because, like, that basically means you can just like send all the, send all the uh, <laughs> bad guys after some other spot in the room, mm -hmm. and then you can pick them off from from the leisure. You can kind of pick your point and that sort of thing, and it's it's absolutely efficient against everything except for the uh, the riveters. Yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. Later in the game, where like they will, they can just hammer you from like a mile away with that rivet. <laughs> and, um, so so yeah, no. You ask about my my. I mean, I can again. I can talk about tactics. I mean, we can talk about particular boss fights, and I can tell you how I how I play this how game. How you and, tackle them? Yeah. Yeah, like I I've I've played this many many times in many many ways. So uh, <laughs> yeah, but but um, I'm a, I'm a heavy wrench player. I like boost all my wrench stuff. I boost like all my speed and everything. Mm -hmm. And by the time I get to past like um, like Fort Frolic and beyond, uh, it's almost just hitting things with a wrench. Yeah, like right, it's right. just hitting them with a wrench. And then the big daddies you use like the trap bolts or you use grenades, and that's uh, pretty. Okay. Good. Yeah. See, my dirty secret is that I'm a very bad gamer. I'm very bad at video games. I love them, but I'm terrible at them. So for me, yeah, the reason I use the wrench and the reason I use plasmid is because I can't aim. Right. Yeah. That's right. No, I have this problem as well, which is why I'm about to track infinite is so like yeah. difficult because it literally takes all that away from you. It and does, yeah. and I, I, that's actually one of the reasons that even though Bioshock Infinite is, you know, is unquestionably a superb game, mm -hmm. I don't enjoy it as much because I'm very bad at it. I'm, right. I'm awful at it. I, any game that gives me an alternative to shooting things is is a great game in my view <laughs> because I'm so bad at shooting things. Um, but it's you know it's it's interesting. You you point out the um, the the kind of illusion of choice, and obviously you know 
that's that is how video games function, isn't it? it the the <laughs> a, a, any choice a video game gives you is illusion, illusory. Yeah, absolutely. By video games' very nature, you're on a track. But um, so I just got a slight tangent, and I'm going to say something. Uh, that, um, a mutual friend of mine and Kit's, Holly, uh, I was having a discussion with her recently about how um, how how a, a theoretically socialist or communist video game would work oh right and okay. because so like when you think about how video games work it, even even when if you if you boil it down to something like experience points it's still earning earning something for completing a task that's yeah, kind of right. how you know on its base level that's how yeah. me- every mecha- mechanic in video games functions you fulfill a task and you earn points or gold mm-hmm. or you know whatever or adam in this instance yeah or adam yeah whatever currency but it is it, it is a currency because you're trading that then for plasmids or powers mm. or levels or whatever it is you're trading it for and it's also Shit. driving the narrative in certain instances isn't it i mean really if you look at like the entire dynamic between uh, in bioshock as to why you harvest the adam it's it is i mean why you kill or encounter the big dad is it's so that you can harvest the adam isn't it Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's the point yeah. of it. It drives the encounter, yeah? Yeah. So is is there such a thing as a video game that doesn't have an inherently capitalist um, yeah. or mechanic? Like a, or like a currency-based mechanic? I, I would... Oh, that's a really good question, actually. The thing that immediately came to my mind were um, the two games by that video game company. Yeah, I know which are. F- but that's the name of the company. I wasn't. That's they're called that video game company. Um, Flower. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, are jo- uh, you gonna say Journey? Yeah, yeah Journey was. Journey is my beautiful. favorite game in what, the world. What I, I would say. Hour about that. Well, maybe, maybe we'll maybe we'll come back and do Journey. That would be great. Oh, but but yeah. one of the things that I. Th- but even though I say that though, there is a mechanic in Journey whereby the length of your scarf increases as you go yes. through, which enables you to jump further. So. Yeah. Yep. But quite. what's interesting about? <laughs> sorry. Go on. But what's interesting about Journey is that you... So what I really liked about Journey is that you are rewarded for guiding other players. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So there are bits of Scarf and bits of Glyph and bits of extra things that you can get, but you can only get them if... Some of them you can only get by cooperating, and some of them yeah. you can only get if a experienced player guides you. So yeah. it incentivizes you to go back and play again, but as a guide to new players. Right. Which I right. think is a really beautiful way of playing. Mm-hmm, but yeah. I mean that's diff- that's a different game. And we you know we say we could talk about Journey. Oh God, yes. Hours uh, another time. It's well up it's, for that. But, no, um, but it's a really interesting. I mean, interesting. Yeah. Just just as an aside, Daniel knows Holly as well. Actually, we're oh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> okay. podcasted together in the in the past uh, <laughs> uh, on other subjects. Yeah, um, but no, you're right. I think that that's. I mean, I'm I'm desperately uh, I'm desperately churning through video games now, trying to think of another one that does anything like that, and I can't. The, it doesn't immediately. I'm doesn't trying to imagine like a version of like Space Invaders or something, mm. where like you start off at the like there are these like giant super powerful beings that are just like annihilating waste among everyone and like extracting resources from the sprites and your job is to be a little sprite that like converts the other sprites into like fighting the big thing instead of the other little ones around you and the way that you do that is by accumulating tiny bits of resources through like some form of like mining or something mm-hmm. and then, like the more of the little sprites you can get to like join you and then they can also join make others join on your cause like that would be the ultimate yeah. you know? that's it's, socialism the game right it's you know? fascinating <laughs> isn't it i mean if any team were going to do it if you're going to get sort of an idea an ideology based video game that explores certain kinds of idea or perspective then ken levine and his team are the ones to do it i mean that seems to be how they create games you look at uh, bioshock and it's about objective ultimately you look at bioshock infinite and it's about well it's, it's what we would call the alt-right at this point and trumpism yeah. and also before trumpism was really a thing um they do seem to create their gaming worlds around pati- very particular ideological perspectives yeah. i mean i think what i would say about the way bioshock handles that though is because i remember the first time i played it and the first time i searched a body and i found dollars on it thinking yeah. like why uh-huh because it's not immediately apparent why you'd want... I mean, if this really is some kind of paradise, why don't we need dollars? This is just yeah. weird. Yeah. And there is a sense 
<laughs> right. And no, no, just... I love, I love that. Like the, 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 just the. I do find this sometimes when I talk to people who are not Americans, who sort of don't get the like, why would we need money in paradise? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, paradise is just having all the money. That's just... <laughs> but equally, in Rapture, there are celebrities, aren't there? I mean, look at yeah. Sandra Cohen. Sandra right. Cohen's whole deal is that he is this amazing artist and, and performer and again you know surely in paradise and in an objectivist paradise we're still but we're still deifying particular people for particular talents which oh is this very is interesting it is definitely part of the satire that it, what's happening in rapture is you're getting exactly what marx says is going to happen in any kind of society which objectivism by the way just completely ignores there's like one of the prob- big problems with objectivism is it it ignores wider context so it ignores things like like history, geneticism, all of that stuff. It just ignores it completely. Uh, doesn't really deal with it in any real sense. Um, but what's happening in Rapture is a coalescence of class structure, a natural coalescence of class structure which shouldn't be there, to the point whereby, of course, in the by the end, you actually have Olympus Heights and then you have yeah. the Apollo Square. Well, I don't, I don't think that that's... I mean, not to... I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to like uh, uh, play the um, what about gamer or sea yeah, lion on this Devil's or whatever. Avocado, yeah. But but I I don't <laughs> think that that's true. I think that like people were brought into Rapture specifically on the uh, you know there there are sort of the wealthy socialites that were like buddies with Andrew Ryan, yeah, and then yeah. there are people who are gonna like gut fish. And, right, uh, right. you know, like, like there is this sort of like, uh, you know, uh, upstairs, downstairs, there is this, there is this class society that they've just kind of brought in. But the way that they sort of bring in poor people is like, oh, I'm the entrepreneurial class. Right. I'm going to come in and I might like gut fish for a while, but I'm smart and I'm, I'm clever. Smart, and like I'm all of us yeah. can, all of us can right. rise above our station if we are like capable of it. And this is how this form of philosophy is like sold to people ultimately. Yeah. You know, but it's like, pull yourself oh, up like, by a bootstrap school of film, yeah, isn't it? It's the fact exactly. that you are a, a temporarily embarrassed billionaire, yeah? Exactly, yeah. and, and and I mean, you know, someone like Fontaine, because he's a completely manipulative shithead, I don't know if anyone read the novel Rapture. Again, no. I got way into this game. <laughs> <laughs> Is it um, worth reading, would you say? No, it's pretty <laughs> terrible. Probably um, not. I mean, I was kind of well, hopeful, but novels well, based was... on video games. If anyone's ever read the Five Nights at Freddy's novels, it's a no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Rapture novel, like it, it was announced, and I sort of went like, "Oh, that sounds interesting." Yeah. Even though I was kind of like waning on my Bioshock, but I'm like, "Yeah, that sounds like yeah, it's worth fifteen bucks or whatever it cost me." It was a trade paperback. Um, I read it, and uh, I haven't read it in a long time, so I. I wouldn't want to like discuss it in detail, but uh-huh. like the author, as I recall, is someone who was way who was like a otherwise like a crime fiction writer right. and writes like kind of hard boiled detective novels, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> um, like you know, kind of the cheap paperback, you know, five dollar mass market thing. I mean, perfectly fine like career. I have no issue with that. I actually uh-huh. enjoy those novels. Um, but he didn't really care about like kind of the sci fi elements and the sort of philosophical elements. Right. And so the Fontaine story is like deeply fleshed out. Like you get long stretches of talking about like who Fontaine was before Rapture and oh, kind of what right. like, he does and you know, it's all about sort of Fontaine's history. And then you get like incredibly simplified versions of like Tenenbaum and Su Chong and uh-huh. you know who are basically just sort of like the cardboard cutouts that are really kind of in the way of this fun, kind of Fontaine mm-hmm. right yeah. narrative. Right. Um, and uh, so, so like my most the, the characters I'm most in, I mean I think Bridget Tenenbaum is one of my favorite characters yeah, in okay. yeah, fiction. Um, honestly, and I hope we we do kind of move on and talk a little bit about. Her. Oh, absolutely! Um, yeah, we've got to. But, I mean, uh, but so yeah, the novel. If you're a big fan, it's it's you could probably get it cheap. It's worth a read, um, mm. but it's not very good. Let's no. just put it that way. <laughs> but it, but it's pretty good at what it does. I don't even blame the author for like writing the book that he did. Like I sort of you know it's the cash in, it's the thing. Okay, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll write this book, and it's it, it, it's fine at what it does. Um, but it was like, deeply disappointing to me to read. I bet there's um, better fiction out there if you look for it. Oh yeah, yeah no, oh, well I can promise you there's better fan fiction. Oh, I've no <laughs> doubt. I've no doubt whatsoever. If ever you look for a tie-in, don't look for a tie-in. Look for the fan fiction. <laughs> I mean, there, there was going to be a film at one point, wasn't there? There was a film that entered yeah. production, which was apparently being directed by Gore Verbinski. Gore Verbinski was attached for a while. Um, Guillermo del Toro was sort no. of like oh, oh, del Toro. Del Toro. Uh, oh. There, there, there have been a lot of attempts at it. I. 
do I not want this here. Well, the whole thing that makes it work is the stuff that like makes it a video game. Yeah, yeah I, I feel agree. like if you're if you end up making a movie out of it, you're either telling a story that's different from the thing that's in Bioshock, yeah. which is sort of the background and the history and all the you know the story of Andrew Ryan, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Or you're basically just watching somebody like discover superpowers and like burn people alive That's for two hours. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> the moral absolutely quandary true. isn't there, is it? And the moral quandary, you know, I know the moral quandary is artificial, but that is the point of it. That's, yeah. You know, that's at the centre of it. Is not, not actually. Let me rephrase <laughs> it. Would, it. It's it not would the be moral difficult. Qu- it would be difficult to make a movie as opposed yeah. to a video game where we're sort of used to like explicit violence against people being a part of the thing. Uh-huh. It'd be yeah. difficult to make a movie with like Brad Pitt. Where like the moral conundrum is is Brad Pitt going to murder children or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not buying that ticket. Though. Protagonist here, you know. You know what yeah. the other thing is as well that, that, that why it wouldn't work. I think part of the power is not knowing anything about the protagonist down to the fact that you don't even yeah. know what he looks like. Right. The protagonist is basically like an audience surrogate until the very end. He he's, he doesn't really have an identity. He's not a person. He's just he's a cipher. Yeah. And that's what makes it work so well is that. It's not about him. Yeah. It, I think that's a really good point. And the, the way the game leans into that fiction, because as you say, when you start, you have that moment on the plane and then you're in the ocean and you know nothing mm-hmm. except you were on a plane and now you're in an ocean and it's on fire. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's one of, let's face it, it's one of the great video game openings. I mean, I was watching your, I watched your first um, Let's Play on this, George. I was just oh, watching it um, just, to, just to kind of refresh my mind before we came on. And that opening's, it's got to be one of my favourite openings of, yeah. of anything. Yeah. Totally. Any, never mind game. Just I think anything, movie, book, anything. It's wonderful. You the way you swim through, and what I love is when you get to the when you get to the what looks like I don't know what it looks like a platform a lighthouse yeah, a something. Sort of lighthouse, you, yeah. You can just watch the plane sink mm-hmm. really slowly. It just gradually sinks. You know, you just watch the tail disappear under the water. It, it's really it's a great opener. It is, and, and you know, just, it yeah, was added it at the eleventh hour. Oh really? Yeah. really? I didn't that, know that opening, they were scrabbling to add so, that in uh, like a month before the game was set to release. It's so good. And as you say, Laura, it plays right into that fiction of being a cipher, doesn't it? Because you don't know anything except yeah. Yeah. you're in the ocean. It's... Yeah, and then you've woken up and then what the hell's going on, yeah. Later on, that whole that same plane ends up uh, like crashing into a tunnel you're walking yes. through. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, that plane is actually there is a spot where you can find it walking around outside the uh, the the, um, the city in uh, Bioshock Two. There actually oh, is a the wreckage. Really? Yeah. Oh, you can find the wreckage. Yeah, <laughs> like it's sort of like off. Of, it's it's just part of the scenery. Like if you look in the right spot, you can sort of see the tail fin and everything. You know, it's it's yeah no, but it's That's it's awesome. there. Guys, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump out now, so please oh, carry on right. talking about it, and I look forward to hearing the rest of this conversation. Oh, of course! Thank you so much for coming. Please on, talk Laura. about Tannenbaum because I want to hear what you yeah, guys think. Yeah, we will. I love Absolutely. Her. Also, by the way, guys, if I can find it, I'm gonna link below to Laura's cosplay. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, you got to say It that. should be on Twitter, but if you have trouble finding it, let me know. I'll link you to it. Uh, cool. Brilliant! Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, Laura. So much, come back, Laura. come back and talk journey with us sometime. That'd be yeah, great. Have I'd a great. Love that. That'd be have nice. a fantastic holiday, though. Have a great yeah, day. Yeah, I will do. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me, as usual. No, it's All a pleasure right. always. Thank you, Laura. Thanks very yeah, much. Yeah, very nice to meet you. Please. Nice to meet you too. Hope to speak again sometime. Right, we'll Teddy Bow. <laughs> yeah, we, we've been we've been obliged. Now we must talk Tannenbaum. I mean, she's she's definitely the character who has one of the most interesting arcs in the game. Because I think she's one of the only characters that you discover via the audio logs. Um, and you, you actually meet face-to-face, of course, a couple of times, who actually does have an arc where she changes. I mean, Ryan is Ryan is Ryan is Ryan all the way through the damn game. And the same yeah, no, is true um, of Fontaine as well. Right, right. And uh, Tenenbaum is, is a fascinating character. Now, it does lean a little bit into, again, just to, to kind of like lay down the criticism first, just mm-hmm. so we can you know, then course. move on and uh, talk about the, the nice thing. It does lean into the, <laughs> I was a monster before, but now I understand that my maternal instinct is real and I must, <laughs> you know, love children. And that's what makes me human mm-hmm. as a as a woman. This is uh, this yeah. is the thing that makes yeah. me a person. You know, um, it, it does it, it plays that, but it also does it well enough that you can sort of justify it as like, well, but also like Langford, it doesn't sort of follow that, and she's clearly someone who has you know uh, more of a moral center certainly yes. than, than many of the other players and the uh, characters in the game. And you know, there are other women that we sort of run into who have like kind of complicated uh, backstories. Oh yeah. Uh, 
you know, uh, Ryan's girlfriend. Oh, and there's this Justine Jolie. Um, but then also, uh, what's her name? Uh, God, I can't believe I can't remember her name. Uh, she's one of the first audio diaries you find. We'll think of it in a minute. But, um, no, Tenenbaum is interesting because, like, her backstory is that she was literally tortured in the Nazi concentration camps mm-hmm. as, a, as a little girl. And, um... And told the doctors who were torturing her that they were doing their experiments wrong, which is actually true if you understand what was it, like if you've researched the Nazi experiments, mm-hmm. like they were not actually performed in any rigorous scientific way. I mean, they yeah. really were just torturing just people, just butchering people, basically, just butchering yeah. people, and without any sense of like kind of scientific validity uh, at all. Like, I mean, there is this sort of like talking point where, oh, but what about all this great science that came out of the the, con- the death camps, and isn't that like sort of a moral conundrum? Room. And it's like, well, not really. It wouldn't, it wouldn't no. be even if, if there's what's the good science that came out of it, and there really isn't any. So, yeah, uh, right. Yeah. I remember an episode of LA Law getting into that in the nineties, and that was actually basically to to the credit of LA Law. That's where they got to where it was like actually. We could, you know, we the data is almost useless. Yeah, the received anyway. wisdom actually, is nonsense. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah actually, as a, as a just factual matter, there was no good data that came out of it. There was no good, like we got nothing out right. of this. Right, uh, right. You know, and not, and also like the whole like questions they were trying to answer were kind of nonsense. I mean, yeah. I mentioned well, it yeah, that's earlier. The problem is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, you know, um, Tenenbaum has this, you know, has this moment. There's an audio diary you find um, in uh, the medical pavilion. It's right Right before you grab the telekinesis blast, um, and she, uh, sorry, just telling people where to find it if you can't remember. Um, <laughs> no, we'll see how far my memory goes on this. But um, and ten of them has an audio diary where um, she says, you know, all these uh, all these shitheads around me are only interested in um, your know, blonde hair and blue eyes. Essentially, yeah. they don't really care about like what makes people smart or stupid. They don't really care about the things that actually matter in humanity, which gets into a very intellectual dark web kind of angle you know kind of um because even like that in itself is also you know not exactly a kind of healthy thing to do but at least that's like sort of looking it does portray the difference between um you know tenenbaum and kind of the people around her but also um someone like uh, steinman who we mentioned um who we talked about a little bit earlier um his concerns are uh physically transforming people into like some image of beauty that he finds and the thing is that he's kind of bored with doing the oh i make the noses smaller <laughs> you know like oh all these jewish people with noses that don't want to have their noses look like that like let's just turn them into little beautiful aryan girls like you sort of get a, a sense of you know from from his description like what he's actually doing there you know um and you can imagine in a uh, you know <laughs> you know all these all these titans of industry want to come in and have larger penises and you know, right, right. Thing, you know? <laughs> um but uh you know th- he's a plastic surgeon so the thing that he's interested in is sort of like you know transforming people into this like vision of other kinds of beauty he describes himself as a picasso that's right um, yes it's this a very is particular the... aesthetic that he's got going on isn't it right and and you know like the bodies that he has are basically just mutilated uh-huh uh, and it's kind of unclear as like, oh, has he kind of fallen into madness, or is he just sort of not physically capable of doing the thing that he's trying to do? Um, you can imagine sort of another version of this in which you run into like, you know, eight-legged people or something like that in this in this like, part of the level where he's like kind of converted people into this like other like various form of beauty. It doesn't right. quite that it leans into just kind of more of a generic there's just blood everywhere and corpses you know um but the medical pavilion would definitely be like you can imagine a sort of different version of that that's sort of like more like a a more um body horror game yeah i mean potentially there's a cronenbergian element there isn't there steinman and the the characters like him could have gone nuts Again, the level design itself is so singular in almost every one of these levels. I mean, there are sort of longer, bigger levels and then kind of smaller bridging levels that serve yeah. as mostly like plot devices, like the Smuggler's Hideout level and the um, the Ryan's Office level. Um, just sort of, like They're just sort of like, you get the bit of plot and then you kind of move on into the other thing. Yeah. Uh, but all of the like, major levels in the game really could, like, so they serve as sort of like their own little, there's, a, there's, a, there's an independent story kind of happening in the background. Yeah. Yeah. of these yeah. and so you can imagine uh, each the- one there's a slightly different tone yeah. you can imagine off the game kind of set in that and the fact that we're literally playing a game that has like nine independent little tonal totally different games yeah. built into it 
is part of what makes Bioshock kind of continually interesting as you play it, you know? Yeah, you totally. Walk, I mean, uh, the I've, same... You know. I've just sorry, reached... Oh, no, pl sorry, go on. No, no, I'm, 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 I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I want to get, I want to let other people talk for a minute, so. <laughs> I mean, I've just reached, um, Sander Cohen's area, um, which is one of my favorites in the entire game, and the aesthetic for, goes for slightly... Frolic, definitely the best level in the for game. For Frolic, it's... which is, it's a sort of diversion from the main quest, because of course you've been sent by Atlas at that point, you've got to get to the Bathosphere, you've got to get to Ryan's office, and you've got to kill him. That's the whole, that's the driving imperative. But suddenly you have this turn, this sort of left turn away from the main narrative into Fort Frolic. And it is almost entirely self-contained, isn't it? There's no, there's no real reason you need to be there other than, the, than it's a transitional area between you and Ryan. And there, within that, there are, there are, there's not just one narrative. There's, entire, there's an entire subculture happening that you pick up slowly as things evolve. I mean... Have you re have you listened to any of the director's commentary? I have not. Um, so, like, you're you're ahead of me on that one. <laughs> I've read some interviews that people like. I mean, years ago, I read interviews yeah. uh, from people uh, who were involved in the making of it. So, but yeah, t tell me what what's what, uh, really fascinating. Every corpse in the in Fort Frolic has a story behind it. Oh, I believe it. I believe Every it. single um, one. I, that is that is the definitely the richest portion of the game, and I think that the like the person who was like the level designer on that went on to be kind of a lead person on Bioshock Two. Um, I seem to remember something to that effect, um, which I have a lot of issues with Bioshock Two. Mainly, yeah. Ken Levine uh, decided not to do it. Yeah, um, right. And so I think I think it suffers uh, a lot from that. But I think that in terms of level design, it's if anything even more. Um, sophisticated in some ways than um, than the first game. I don't know. Like, yeah. Eventually, we'll talk Bioshock 2, right? I haven't oh, played absolutely. It so long, yeah, I so, think yeah. I mean, for my money, I know Bioshock 2 comes in for a lot of stick, and it really does. I mean, a lot of people said that it could have just been DLC. It's not different enough from the previous game, and I, I get that. That is certainly a criticism that you could level at it, but I do think that a lot of its positive elements are missed as a result of that, it does tend to be just ignored and people just move on to Bioshock Infinite, yeah. which is a bit it's, 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 it's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, it's yeah. got like some really nice things, some really interesting new additions, but then a whole lot of stuff that sort of feels like it's it's um, kind of bringing up the rear. Yeah. And um, I think some of the mechanics and some of the ways that the fights work just sort of don't work for me. But, um, yeah, sorry, kid, I, I was talking over No, you. no, it's okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, I only played uh, 2 for the first time very recently, and I, oh, right. I mean, I've... Yeah, and I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I just, I think I just liked going back to Rapture. I just liked having more to do in Rapture, and yeah. I liked, I did like being a big daddy. I liked the mechanics of the underwater sequences a lot. I liked, mm -hmm. I mean, the first moment when a level actually floods. Yeah was actually I found really thrilling because I realized psychologically I've been expecting that to happen for the entire first game it feels like a natural consequence and you have moments don't you as you mentioned earlier where the plane crashes yeah. into the the tunnel we have the the, the sense that it's fun but of course it's you know you don't really. drown you run no. through it and you get out you but can most, just stand the route, there and it's not going to flood it's it's a it's a sort it, there are lots of areas like that in Bioshock 1 where it feels like there's a time limit but there actually yeah, isn't but there actually isn't but but in that one the, the first moment a chamber actually floods completely and everyone drank you see the bodies floating and yeah. you just think oh wow <laughs> yeah i mean um, that is something so there's, I a lot, there's a lot to well. like about too i think and I, yeah. I i take the point about it could have been dlc but i still think that it's uh i think it's got yeah i think it's well, got I, a lot, I mean i haven't i don't, played it I don't think it could have been dlc i mean i think it's it's a fully fledged game of its <laughs> own i think my my issues are more uh narrative yeah. and um ludo narrative and uh, sort of sort of just uh, kind of playability i don't find it nearly as playable as the first game um, is, but uh, I'd want to replay it before I can have like a real conversation about that. And likewise, uh, it has, likewise, it has it's, it's, of, it's like, the, the one the, I remember the least about. The only thing, one of the most prominent things I remember is is what Kit was saying, which is the experience, like the physical sensation of being a big daddy. Um, yeah, that's. <laughs> Whereas, you know, it's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, in the first yeah. game, obviously, you you feel quite vulnerable. You know, you are ultimately, no matter how much you splice yourself up, you're just a guy. Um, you feel huge and weighty and plodding in Bioshock 2, which is something I really, really like, because I really appreciate it. And they do a great trick where you see a shadow every now and then, and just like, whoa, oh no, that's me. Yeah, right? <laughs> I do, I do just, wonder just, just in how, how, what, uh, how do you guys play these? Um, what what um, what difficulty level? 
Oh, um, the the first Bioshock I can I can complete on the hardest difficulty level. It's been a long time since I've done it. A very long time. I tend to play just the normal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I um I I remember this. I used to listen to a podcast called Idle Thumbs, which uh, was a kind of a video game podcast. It it, it 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 skewed towards the indie market, but it would cover yeah. some of the mainstream stuff if they liked it. And they, I remember hearing a game designer interviewed on there saying that most games are designed to be played on the hard difficulty setting, actually. And that if you want to get the, the well balanced experience, you want to use hard. You don't want to go for impossible mm. because that's that generally they've skewed it to make it. Re- but like hard is meant to be the ideal. Yeah. And I have uh, both times I've played Bioshock, I've gotten to the second Big Daddy fight on hard, and then I've switched to normal because I just can't. I can't get past <laughs> the second Big Daddy. I just can't do it. Oh, the, that first one in Neptune's Bounty, that one. Yeah, and I just yeah, like, that's just like, that. That one is through. definitely the hardest Big Daddy fight in the entire game. Is that a yeah. is it a rosy Big Daddy or is it a, a normal no? That's Big a Daddy yeah, that's a that's a rosy. That's yeah. a rosy. Um, yeah, and that's the that's the one where the the only way to beat that is with uh, by throwing the barrels at it. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, yeah, that's a I I, I so I uh, on. Um, uh, perhaps uh, unexpectedly can play this on hard without <laughs> <laughs> and in fact in replaying it having not played it in a couple of in literally years uh-huh. I like sat down to it and I was kind of playing it late at night and realized like oh I can't actually immediately predict exactly where every enemy is going to be and therefore I am frustrated with myself for not having pulled out the particular kind of ammunition I need to fight that enemy at this particular moment um you know uh someone has played this game a lot um but yeah no I I can play I can play all three of these games on hard without uh Vita Chambers oh Um, wow yeah that's it's how many impressive. times I've I've played them. Um, it's not impressive. It's completely. It's it's the. Uh, for a long time, I would literally like come home from work at eleven o'clock at night and just sit and play Bioshock for two hours wow. and just sort of like load up an old save, uh-huh. like just go play Fort Frolic again. Yeah, you know? just to be in uh-huh. Rapture. Yeah, just to be in. Yeah, immersed. Just to be kind of wandering through it and just kind of always thinking like one day I'm gonna buy like a TV export card and I'm gonna do my own like you know like playthrough uh-huh. and like show all the strategies I've developed over years. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's probably never going to happen. But, uh, you know, <laughs> who wants to watch me play a 13-year-old video game uh, perfectly? Uh, but you know, it's fine. Well, it's it's fine. Oh. shot. I mean, you'd be right. surprised. Yeah, it's, it's I got mean, a fan base Twitch to this TV day. as well, streaming it. I mean, that does yeah, seem yeah. to be the thing at the moment, doesn't it? I think you could actually get away with that. And you did, you did mention this. something I wanted to pick up on though, which is, and again, it's this. Uh, sorry, I'm diving back into mechanics again. One of the things that I struggle with, I think, the most in Bioshock, I got the hang of managing the plasmids eventually, but I found managing the ammo types really difficult because I found the length of time it takes you to switch ammunition with the animation actually got me killed an awful lot yeah. whereas in yeah. the situation where it's like oh i know i need oh no okay i need to switch to armor piercing machine gun rounds or, or anti-personnel machine gun rounds and just by the time the animation's done i'm just fried <laughs> um, the, the trick there is to sort of like you know again i'm a mostly wrench player so uh, right. uh, the trick there is that i use uh, particular weapons for particular purposes um so like the pistol i use to take down um, um security cameras Right, okay. um, and so you just always put the armor piercing in that, mm-hmm. and then right. like you know, once you do a little bit of research, it's three shots. Yeah, will take down one of those, and then later in the game, once you've done a lot more research, it's it's two, and even one takes you almost to the you know, like it's. And this is on hard. Um, yeah. I did literally buy the PS3 version of the game specifically to play it on the survivor mode <laughs> right. to prove to myself that I could also beat it on survivor mode without uh, you know. <laughs> so I. <laughs> yeah, um, and and I I have not I I don't like the uh, the PS3 controller as much, so I usually just play it on uh, the 360. But uh, like all the strategies that I have are efficient enough that it actually works as well on the survivor <laughs> mode. Um, but that first couple of levels is is very it's it's quite a challenge on that on that level. But um, I can well you know. imagine. 
Um, it's not it's not that much harder than hard. I didn't. I mean, it was it's just kind of like more bullets that you need. You just have to. But like again, like the way I play, because you never use ammo effectively. Um, you, you're just kind of like banking ammo for the whole game anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, there's a, there's a there's a great playthrough that's I mean you know like 12 years old or something now. This this uh, uh, YouTuber Matt Titty M A C T I D D Y who um, I watched his playthrough when I was kind of struggling with it and he was. Yeah, and he basically I, I I used I cribbed a lot from him, although I developed a lot uh, from there, you know. So, yeah, you get to hear about all my Bioshock nerdery. <laughs> but no, That's I use like I I, I use the machine gun. I use the machine gun like I just load it with anti personnel rounds because okay. if I'm like down to the point of needing the machine gun, I've got like a bunch of splicers firing at me or something, you know. Like if I get myself in a corner somehow, like I just need to spray and pray at that point, you know, and that's. <laughs> Almost always against, um, you know, just regular human splicers as opposed to, like, a big daddy. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only time I would use, like, uh, you know, occasionally I'll use, like, the armor-piercing um, uh, machine gun rounds, and that's all, like, like, that's only against, like, a big daddy in, like, a very specific context where, um, you know, the big daddies in Fort Frolic are um, bouncers, and so there are places where you can, like, jump in a place where they can't get you and then like, just kind of pick them off. Yeah, um, yeah. Because they can't hit you, it's not like they don't have a big gun. So again, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we could go through every particular big daddy fight if you're interested. <laughs> I love it. I, I mean, actually, I mean, this is something I meant to ask at the beginning, but sort of doing this ass backwards. But where, I mean, where did you guys first encounter Bioshock? Where did it come from for you? You can go ahead, Daniel. I can't remember. Oh, um, yeah, just uh, a friend of mine was into video games, and I had you know, owned a 360, and you know, he was like, "Oh, you should try to play Bioshock no. if you want to get into video games." And it was like, "Oh, you're into philosophy, you're into you know this kind of stuff. It's a really fascinating game." And he was like somebody who played like System Shock and mm -hmm. System Shock Two, and he was like kind of more into it. And I was just kind of like, "Yeah, that sounds good." And um, I found it like not really even knowing like how to play a first person shooter with the with the 360 was uh, you know that's a very challenging game you know at the beginning and yeah, <laughs> even playing right. it like um, like kind of learning like how to search bodies and stuff. I mean that's yeah. that's the level at which I first approached this game. Because if you, if you haven't I remember... played first person shooters before, like the core mechanics uh, are very very complex in Bioshock. Yeah. You know, you have I mean the... I played um, I played Quake a lot right. like on my on right. my uh, like on my PC kind of in the nineties uh -huh. and that I you know, like the only but I never really got very good at that. You uh -huh. know? Like I, so like uh, the again, very early kind of... days of first person games. Right, and then kind of skipped ten years. Yeah. Yeah, and then kind yeah. of <laughs> for Bioshock, and uh, you know, sort of, sort of playing it that way, and um, yeah, no, so, so it kind of like taught me how to how to play games, and I kind of fell in love with it. But um, I really only kind of did gaming for a couple of years before I just sort of like you know stopped following it, and also the kind of the deeply misogynistic kind of bullshit that you know it's, when Gamergate happened. It's and, you know, problematic. Yeah. It is, and yeah. it's still a problematic market. I mean, the portrayal of women is different. Is problematic. The there's the the entire video gaming culture, which seems to be used as a recruitment ground for the alt right at the moment. Um, that is massively problematic. But they are. I mean, there there are sort of niche areas of video gaming that are well worth looking at. Mostly in the indie market now. Yeah, there you're getting some amazing stuff happening there. Oh, yeah. just like incredible stuff. I mean, one that I would heartily recommend for you, Daniel, is Papers, please. Oh yeah, I have I have been that has been recommended to me many times. Yeah, I think yeah, just just from listening to your uh, your podcasts and whatnot, I think you would get <laughs> yeah. a massive kick out of papers. Please, I really do. My my issue these days is I have very rarely have time to sit and kind of like devote time to a video game. Yeah. Um, and you know for you know reasons that should become obvious if you listen to my podcast. of course of course. <laughs> No, no, I, I, yeah, I, I have similar issues with the time these days, or we're for different reasons. But I think that um, I was You're making about a living what, as a writer. Like, well, yeah. I, I'm really not, but I'm trying to. Try. Um, yeah. But I was, I was, <laughs> I'm certainly putting in the hours. Let's put it like that. But I think I was thinking about. So I, I mean, as you know, George, we talked about this before. So my history of video gaming is primarily PC gaming, and I was yeah. in on the ground floor with first-person shooters. So I, I played Wolfenstein. Oh, Wolfenstein never mind, and Doom. Never mind, quite there, yeah. and Doom. I played Wolfenstein. Yeah, and that was quite something. Um, and I think that. I was PC gamer through the sort of mid noughties and then it was a brief period where I didn't have anything at all. And then we got a PlayStation 3, I think 
two years after they came out. Right. So the pretty, the, the, like the first price drop, and that was for that was for the boy. That was for my stepson, uh, who was I don't know whatever, like ten or eleven at the time. He had a PS2, and then he upgraded to a three. Mm-hmm. Or we, you know, the household upgraded to a three because I could persuade the missus. You know, it's got a Blu-ray player, so yeah, it's it's really just a good way of getting a cheap Blu-ray player. You know? <laughs> yeah. Of course, but, that's the know, reason. That, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, that's why we need a PlayStation Three. Right, yeah, right. so. Um, and then what I did was I was I remember I was really inherit I was really like intensely following IGN at the time because they they seemed to be pretty good at assessing. I mean there were a couple of writers there I really liked. It was Kezia McDonald in particular who since she writes for the Guardian. I was going now. to say she's transcended now a little bit, hasn't quite, she? Quite, quite, yeah, quite dramatically, and, and good for her. She's a fantastic writer. But I remember reading her stuff on on IGN and really liking it. And just what what IGN I found were really good for was they they got most of the temporal releases pretty much right yeah. and. If you assume that the person writing the review liked the kind of game they were reviewing, and that was their default, then you could calibrate accordingly. So, you know, I kind of ignored the Call of Duty reviews because it's like, well, okay, but I don't like Call of Duty, yeah, so, so it doesn't it's... matter. But what I did was, I, once I'd filtered for genre, for want of a better word, what I did was basically went through most of the eight, and the, the, the nine and ten point games <laughs> and gradually tried to accumulate them. So I, I call it like the PS3 canon, basically. <laughs> um, it's your Shadows I'm of still, the Colossus, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and I've got like, I've got, I don't know, what, 60 or 70 PS3 games, and I've played maybe half of them, and I'm very <laughs> slow. And there's a couple that aren't canon right that i just like the look of the yeah. kane and lynch games i absolutely love and they, they were not nine out of ten games at all they were quite bad in a lot of ways mm-hmm. but they were bad in a way that i was i was interested in yeah um but, but certainly bioshock obviously was one of the i think bioshock was like a 9.8 or from something from that era as well it was one of yeah. the dominant games wasn't it i mean that's it, right it, it dropped like a like a bombshell didn't it? It, it changed it actually changed the way people create games you know but it took me a long time to get to it because I had to learn how to play first-person shooters on the PlayStation 3, and that wasn't ah. easy because I was used to mouse and keyboard. Of course. And uh, it's it's a totally different technique, and it, it took me a long time. So I played through like uh, it's I think- interesting that you came to it through through the PS3 because that version wasn't released until like, years later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I wasn't. I didn't have a PC that was capable of gaming by that point. Right. The right trouble, yeah. The, Trouble was that that, that keeping keeping uh, on top of having a powerful enough PC to play yeah. the games was just financially impossible at that yeah. point. Um, so I just you know yeah I dropped back to consoles. Um, but I remember learning learning how to play a first person shooter on the on the PlayStation. I think it was Resistance Two, which was uh, you know quite a big title on the PS3 at the mm-hmm. time. Um, and a few others like that, and then eventually I kind of so I sort of built up to it really. But by the time I got to Bioshock, I was confident enough using the kind of you know, using the the the, the joystick yoke as a kind of, I'd, you know, I'd adjusted to doing that instead of having a mouse for vision, and and also the switch because with a mouse I was using my right hand, and now it's on the left for the vision. So it was all that kind of, just mechanically getting used to that. It's interesting um, that you had that learning curve because that is something that when you watch the interviews with Ken Levine and his team, because you know it was a really quite, they were still irrational games at that point, a really small team that right. created Bioshock. It's essentially, it's essentially an indie game made good. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's. I mean, there are there are indie studios that are way bigger now mm. than Irrational Games was when they made Bioshock, and they came from PC gaming as well. I mean, almost all of their releases up to that point had been PC games, so right. they also struggled with translating the mechanics, which essentially the mechanics of System Shock Two, to a console mm. format, to working on a joypad. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it just—it still feels. I mean, Bioshock feels like a PC game to me, hundred oh, percent. Totally does. Totally. Um, and does. and I think that, funnily enough, the place where that most comes into play, I think, in the game is one of my favourite things, which we haven't talked about at all yet, which is the hacking mini game. Oh, of course, <laughs> yeah, which right. I absolutely fucking adore. Pipe Mania, yeah. Yeah, because I had the Amiga game Pipe Mania, oh, so as soon as I God, hit my first hacking it. game, I was like, I'm in heaven. And I <laughs> yeah. was like, oh, heaven, I'm gonna hack every single fucking thing of this. Game. Right, I, I do exactly literally, that. Exactly I literally play that. the hacking game twice what? in the entire game. <laughs> really? Oh wow! So I mean, this is there's the one that you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's like a turret in like the next room uh-huh. where it costs too much to auto hack it. Uh-huh. And then every other time through the game, I but I think it's because playing on the 360, it's just so slow to move the tiles uh, around. Yeah, it is. Whereas so- I think the the PC version, like the people that I've seen who like get really like 
and I, I don't know, maybe I, you can disagree with me. The people that re- really love it are the ones who can like un- unearth all the tiles really quickly and then move uh, stuff yeah. around. That's Whereas on the, the 360, the it's so slow. It is so slow. Yeah. And so I literally play. I I hack exactly twice, <laughs> and I oh, never wow. even open all. I never even open up all my hacking. Like <laughs> I've done it just to get the achievement. Like uh-huh. just bought the hacking uh, slots at the end. Right. Yeah. But right. it literally doesn't matter. It's like you know, <laughs> I and and I. I take photos of the um, the turrets so I can auto hack the turrets. Uh-huh. Like you can like this bit where you can just like freeze them and then like hot hack them uh, without having to play the game yeah. or having to spend money on it or anything. Um, and so uh, yeah, that's 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 the way I deal with the hacking. Is do as little of it as do as literally as little of it as is personally possible. <laughs> and that is, I do it twice in the game. That's oh, it. I mean, if you watch and my I let's literally play just... of it, I I hack everything. Yeah, me even, too. even when I don't need to, even when it's completely <laughs> bloody pointless, I like the health stations. There is no point yeah, in hacking every them. Time. Everything. I just can't. I can't resist the game. I love it. I love it to bits. It's a little game of pipe mania. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was Pipe Dream over here in the U.S. There was yeah. an NES game that was called Pipe Dream, and I remember right. playing that. A bit. Um, but yeah, um, yeah like no. kids, I, I remember the the Commodore Amiga version, which Amiga came on version. floppy disk and made you know, terrible noises, <laughs> terrible, terrible <laughs> noises. <laughs> Ah, oh, nostalgia. Oh, it's so great. So <laughs> no, so I love it, and I also love it because actually, I mean, it the, the the thing about the hacking game, and I don't think I don't think it's the same in two, unfortunately, but it kind of pauses the action as well. Yeah. So you get a chance to get your breath back while you're doing the hacking game, figure out. Yeah, what it doesn't doing. it doesn't pause in two, and that's like just that's sort of right. like a speed test game where you're yeah, like, I don't, to, like a green like slot or whatever. Yeah, I think I, I really don't like. It. I mean, no. I understand why they did it, and it's be- it's obviously more console friendly in two, but I. Yeah. Don't, it's, it's I miss it, man. I miss Pipe Mania. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as well, man. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Because that is actually one of the elements that the game comes for. It comes in for some stick for when it's looked back upon now, because now hacking systems tend to be automatic. You know, they tend to be uh, percentage based or something to that effect, based on whatever skill you've got. Like sure. in uh, the Outer Worlds, for example, a more recent video game. Um, the hacking is just based on what hacking skill you have and to what degree you've upgraded it, and it just does it automatically. Um, people tend to say that the Pipe Mania game, or the, the notion of a hacking mini game, it punctuates the action a little bit too much, it takes you out of the world a little bit too much. I, I really like it myself. I it really is enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, you can see that point. And, and I love, I mean, one of the other things I love about it is how kind of idiosyncratic it is as a visualization the idea that you're right. literally moving tubes around yeah inside the machine to get a flow of fluids from one point to another right, I mean, what, right what I, even is that i don't I mean, even but i love it because this is the gears these guys went under right. these guys went under the under the ocean in 1946 which is right, three right. years before the invention of the of the of the computer like uh-huh. ENIAC is 1949 yeah, yeah. so i mean the the transistor is 1947 right. so they've developed this entirely different um, version of uh, you know like computer technology which is based on fluid mechanics right uh, right isn't that great though don't you love that as a piece of yeah. fiction i, I, I wish I, I love it i wish it was a little bit more fleshed out um, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, in terms of uh, in terms of some of the narrative like that's something we haven't seen in any of the games or any no, of the actually. other media yeah, it's like who developed this technology? You know, it's just sort of like, oh, there were a bunch of geniuses right, right, who were yeah. doing a whole lot of drugs and so forth. <laughs> Genius billionaires beneath the ocean, you know. Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Thomas Edison, and uh, Tesla, and uh, you know, Goebbels himself. And, uh, what would they develop after after thirty years? I mean, what you just said there made me think. It's like this: you, we've had steampunk, but this is like ocean punk. Ocean right? punk, it, yeah. Fluid it's, punk. It's what would you? Call fluid it? punk, or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. But I love it as well. You can see like the little gears spinning in the background. I don't know. No, I love it. I love that I little hacking. I do too. I, I really enjoy it. I mean, <laughs> there is a slight skill-based element to it too, whereas there isn't anymore. You know, because it is just automatic, and you stay in game generally yeah. whenever a hacking mechanic comes up. Um, I like the skill-based element of it, and it, of course. Later on, when the hacks get really difficult and it gets incredibly fast, it's very, very, very hard. Uh, the safes are the really tough one because there's normally one route through, and you've got yeah. almost no time before the fluid starts coming. And you've really, and you might have to flip that first tile depending on the route through. <laughs> Um, the safes are really challenging, yeah. But what I mean, what was your experience of the game? 
like initially kit what is i mean for i mean i know for me when i first played it it was like revelatory it was just it was the the aesthetic beauty of it it was the fact that it was so smart so literate it just blew my mind I mean, I think I spent a lot of time really, really struggling with the mechanics the first time <laughs> I played. Because having learned how to play first-person shooter, I was now playing effectively a, a dual weapon-wielding mm -hmm. first-person shooter. Because mechanically, that's what it is, right? You've got the you've got the plasmids on one hand and yep. the gun in the other, and you kind of it took me. I'm just a I'm just a turtle brain. It just takes me a long time <laughs> to get my head around a mechanic, right. you know. And it was like, I think. The first big revelation was like, all oh, right, if I hold down the button to change plasmids, the game actually pauses. Yeah. And once I realised that, that helped a lot. You know, <laughs> so if I'm changing weapon or I'm changing plasmid, the game is paused. Uh huh. So I kind of ruthlessly exploited that to kind of get my breath back in the middle of a fight and figure uh -huh. out what I was doing, kind of thing. But the main, the main thing I remember about that first playthrough was just the atmosphere. Yeah. I just, I can never, I, you know, I can't remember a game that has an atmosphere exactly like that. It was quite incredible. There were, of course, elements of, of, of survival horror, especially mm -hmm. those first couple of levels. You, you're husbanding ammunition, you get yeah. small amounts, and then you get these... And the first time one of them fuckers turns up on the ceiling. You oh, know, just spider splices. The ceiling, so yeah, you're just like, right. fuck off, man. Yeah. Or the... Um, uh, the the, the white splicers, the white spider splicers in uh, Fort Frolic, oh, where right. those are, where they'll like freeze in place, and you don't know which ones are actually like like plaster and which ones are, are people, <laughs> and they've got like four <laughs> times the 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 health of the regular yeah, spider right. splicers. That's yeah, where no, doing no. the that's where getting the uh, the photographic damage bonuses is really going to be. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Doing your David Attenborough thing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The, oh, the, the, the rapture oh. safari. And there's a. There's a trick to this, by the way, if you, uh, you know, just, just for anyone, like, thinking about playing the game, um, you can move dead bodies mm -hmm. with, uh, your telekinesis. Uh, you cannot move live bodies that are, like, hiding, that are sleeping on the floor. Um, so if you walk into a room and you're not sure if that person is alive or dead, uh -huh. uh, just try to hit them with telekinesis. Right, and, right. Because, uh, yeah. Because they pull that jump scare a few times in the game, don't they? Where you walk past a body and then it leaps up and attacks you. Primarily is, in uh... Fort Frolic, I seem to recall. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly in Fort Frolic. They do it in Fort Frolic, and there's one in particular in um, Olympus Heights. Oh, right. Uh, where uh, you kind of walk around a corner and there's a body slumped against a, a pole, and uh, I always at that moment I I know he's there, so I yeah. just hit him with a uh, with a bolt, uh, <laughs> right, of his head, and it dies. So it's fine. Yeah. But, uh, it's like when you first no. encounter the Houdini splicers in Arcadia. Oh man, those fuckers! I love them to bits. They are. I love the whole Wicker Man thing they've got going on. You know, the notion that they they're not only a very particular kind of splicer, but they've even developed their own little weird pagans subculture <laughs> harness the flames harness the right, mist right. and think they're <laughs> drinking ambrosia to an ancient I god just, I god love I it. love Langford I, love, I Langford. love the whole thing to bits I think it's brilliant it's just a, such a wonderful I, I mean I love that throughout the game the splicers do this a lot they seem to create and cultivate these tiny little subcultures like Steinman's got his own cult around him Sander Cohen's got his own little cult and then you've got the Houdini splicers and the spider splicers I don't even want to know what they're doing quite frankly it's more like a colony or a nest, isn't it? <laughs> they're they're just a bunch of internet nerd nerd sub communities. These are subreddits. Right, right. <laughs> <wandering> into. <laughs> but like, I think when you when you first encounter the Houdini splices, he he pulls the same trick as uh, we were talking about earlier with that that um, medical splicer in the medical pavilion. You encounter, you, you go into Arcadia and you find one of their little shrines that has a mask on it and it has some like offerings and whatnot. And when you turn around, there's a Houdini splicer right there and he just bursts into that sort of red mist and confetti and he's gone. Well, you see him like he's running from you at first, That's and then it, he's yes. um, like he's kind of appearing and disappearing, and you know it's kind of really unclear what's going on. But yeah, then you kind of run into this little spot. It's got some money, and I think like a grenade or something. Yeah, yeah. And you turn around, and um, he's right there. And then the moment is to just have your fire ready and just light him on fire. Let you him can do quite a bit of damage with him that way. Yeah. Because he has this whole like animation that he goes through while you chase him up the uh, stairs, <laughs> and he continues to take damage. Right, right. I mean, what, what about you? I mean, what what was your initial like response to this? I mean, you're coming at it from a slightly different perspective, of course, Daniel, not having really played 
many video games up to that point. Right. I mean, you, you know, fighting with mechanics is obviously a, uh, an immediate thing. You know, just kind of learning how to play games at yeah. all. Yeah, And, right. like, kind of approaching Bioshock with that. Um, it was a really kind of difficult experience. Like, I was fascinated with it. Yeah. Um, but even on easy, like, the first time I ran into, like, a security camera, <laughs> like, I didn't even recognize, like, what to look for. And obviously now you're just, I'm sort of used to... Oh, it's a red light. Yeah. Like, it's, obvi- it's this very visually distinct thing. But if you kind of don't know what to look for, right. like, if you're not sort of programmed by, like, having played games, is to, like, this is how video games visually demonstrate to you how to, like, look for a thing. Yeah, so, so like the oh, there's a camera. light that's moving around. And so if you're not sort of, like, looking for that, or if it's all just sort of, um, it's all just sort of part of this, like, thing that you're experiencing then you're not necessarily kind of looking for that thing. Yeah, yeah. And so I remember getting, like, caught in that particular, like, in that, um, in, in um, um, Steinman's office, mm-hmm. uh, where you run into that first security camera, and I could not find the camera. I had no idea what the fuck I was supposed to be doing. And I just kept getting, like, shot at by these, like, security bots. And I used up, like, every bit of ammo I had. I died, like, four times. And I was just like, okay, fuck this. I don't know what's going on here. Um, you know, at some point I started like looking for like videos about like how to how to confront certain things, and that's kind of where I found that. Uh, oh, that um, is, I mean, that is so fascinating because because you didn't have the sort of the pre-programming of video game grammar, right? That it developed up to that point, you didn't know what to look for, and that that is particularly problematic in Bioshock, which is a game that is so aware of what the, the grammar of video games is that it even lampoons it a, mil- yeah, a couple of times. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, and so, like, I come at this very much as someone, uh, you know, it, it's weird that I'm even talking about video games, right. <laughs> you know, because I play so few of them, but I very much know Bioshock. Yeah, so, that... <laughs> And if you want to do a Dead Rising one, we can do Dead Rising as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, at um, some point. I mean, um, would you be interested at some point in doing um, Bioshock Infinite in the same way? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant, because that I mean, is... we could definitely do Bioshock, Bioshock 2, and Bioshock Infinite. I could talk for hours about all three of us. I'm definitely up for that. I'm going to have to play Bioshock 2 first. I'm definitely going to have to replay it, because I haven't played it for... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm. my plan is to get through my Bioshock playthrough, and if we, like, schedule the Bioshock 2, I will um, sit back down with that one. You know, I'm happy to I'm happy to replay it, uh, certainly. Brilliant. Absolute brilliant. And, of course, Infinite. I mean, if you if you start Bioshock, then you've got to do Infinite. Oh, yeah, and I do, I do Infinite on 1999 mode. Um, and, <laughs> honestly, I never do the... I never did the... I never finished the Burial at Sea. Um, DLC because yeah. at that point I was uh, kind of working through school and kind of doing had like I was just kind of completely done. I played uh-huh. part one once um, and I never played part two, so I almost think Burial at Sea should be its own separate bit that we do as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean Burial at Sea, and in fact bo- all of the DLC for um, for Infinite that deals with Rapture, it, it really fulfills something that I. I've wanted for the longest time, which is to see Rapture at different stages of its evolution. Yep. I mean, one thing I would... They won't ever do it again, because of course the game is pretty much done at this point, but I would love them to release some DLC for the original game, which is just a walking simulator that allows you to walk around Rapture, the various floors and levels, as it was before the shit hit the fan. When things seem to be working... Did we lose Kit? I think, I think we, we may, I think we may have lost Kit. Uh, that happens. That happens with Kit when we podcast with Kit. <laughs> I think we may have. I'm sure he'll turn up again at some point, okay. reasonably soon. But yeah, I mean, I, I and of course you get to do that in some of the uh, the DLC for. Uh, oh, lost power. Okay, I just yeah. got a message from him. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. no problem. No problem at all. I'm sure we can uh, work around that one. Um. But yeah, you you bring you bring in people on an island that don't know how to do, uh, maintain your electrical grids. Apparently, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's it's problematic. It really is, and I'm surprised the internet hasn't cut out or something to that effect. <laughs> to be honest, we have a lot of issues with these podcasts. 
Um, but yeah, wouldn't that be something just to be able to see Bioshock? And also, like what you were talking about earlier, you know, when you were saying that the only real way to interact with people in Rapture when you when you play Bioshock is to kill them. Essentially, you're just figuring right. out different ways well, to kill them. An- another game that we did that my wife got more into than I did, but I played a couple of times was Fallout Three. Ah. And you know, having like that kind of like open world version mm. of Rapture would be oh. interesting, which is part of what like Burial at Sea Part one as i recall you get a little bit of that you get a little bit more of like before everyone was just openly trying to kill each other yeah really. you could you can kind of wander around and and kind of see the shops and see yeah. kind of various places and and you do get a sense of the culture um i would love to see that kind of um like the kind of that fallout 3 mechanic mm-hmm. applied to a sort of pre-disaster rapture <sighs> Oh my goodness! Yeah, that would be wonderful. Where you go? I could also do a Fallout Three if you want to do Fallout. Oh 3 yeah, I'm point, well yeah. up for that. Well up for that. I love Fallout Three. I, 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 my favorite of the Fallout games is New Vegas, um, which I thought was stunning, absolutely stunning. But I would. I'm, I never. I started that one. I never finished it. But um, right. uh, but I'm more I, than happy you know, to do three. When I when I have like a hundred hours to put into that, I would yeah. be happy. To do and it <laughs> is. I mean, it's <laughs> it's. Uh, if anything, I would say it's even more expansive than Fallout Three. There's so there's a lot more going on in New Vegas. There's a lot more going on oh, in no, terms no, no, of definitely, like, definitely. The, the morality anyway, system. should not discuss future podcasts. No. But <laughs> this is something, I mean, I'm so sorry, this is something Kit and I do all the bloody time. You know, we, we talk about what we're going to talk about, then we start talking about it, and then it becomes a mini-podcast in and of itself. Um, I, I listened to the Joker conversation, I right. apologize. That's, that's all the work I did prepping for <laughs> doing the podcast. I was since we ramble. We ramble massively. It seems to That's be our fine. milieu at this point. But yeah, I mean, could you imagine that kind of format applied to Rapture pre pre Civil War with Fontaine, basically? I mean, imagine being sent by Tenenbaum to go on like a mission to go and like find uh, sea slugs. Yeah. yeah, we're looking for sea slugs. I think there might be something weird kind of going on uh-huh. with them sort of thing yeah and you're just some like dock worker and so like okay and then you have to go and like find the 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 face mask and you have Mm -hmm. to like pay for it which means then you have to like find the money like you have to do a certain amount of work in order to get the face mask and then you know like yeah i mean you can imagine a richly detailed like uh rpg type uh, world yeah oh my god with no shooting people. No, just conversation. Just, yeah, like just a, it, yeah. it's, it's what they call a walking simulator these days, which is kind of sure. derogatory, but there's an entire swathe of these things that are, they're just experiential, essentially. They are just experiential. Oh, hello, Kit. Hi. I can, I can actually see you as well at the moment. Yeah, I'm just right? trying to, <laughs> 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 I'm to make myself disappear <laughs> But no, I mean, a, a sort of walking simulator of Rapture. Ah, oh, where you could actually engage in dialogue with people, and you could have different like options to what you said. And like a classic RPG, I would I would eat that up. I, I'm sure yeah. lots of people would eat that up. I was thinking about a tabletop game. Ooh. I was thinking about a role-playing campaign based in Rapture Oof. during the during the you know the initial period where there's still the, the Civil War still under the surface. I think oh it could be fantastic. Well, and particularly if you did some version of the story that sort of began in I mean because the whole thing is that the revolution starts in like 1959, like yeah. New Year's Eve 1959. Yeah. And so, like, if you started in, say, New Year's Eve in 1958, and the whole point was yeah. you're sort of getting this, like, process of kind of watching the tensions boil over. Um, you know, and, and we mentioned um, Ryan's girlfriend. I can't believe I, I can can't never remember. I can never remember her name, but she's such a significant character. <laughs> she's such an amazing character. She's both she's... one of the... She's literally... She's not literally the first audio diary you find, but she's, I think, one of the... Depending on like what order you walk around mm-hmm. in that room, she's among the first. Yeah, and she's one of the few characters in Rapture who's almost entirely sympathetic as well. She is because like she's she's a she's a girl who just sort of um, you know, finds herself in Rapture yeah. and she kind of finds herself as uh, Ryan's girl, mm-hmm. and then like he's kind of running off with like the supermodel. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, she finds herself just kind of alone and uh, disenchanted with the whole process and like you learn this entire story and this is something that I think is really fascinating with the way that the game um, that tells its story uh, because again like the whole process of like the way that I play the game and the way that you're meant to play the game is like 
a guy shows up, you burn him alive, or you shock him and hit him with a wrench, or <laughs> just hit him with a wrench, or um, you make a security bot. You like it's murder. That's yeah. what you do. Yeah, the, yeah. the game is murder. It's mm-hmm. murder. You're just murdering things. Yeah. Um, and then occasionally you collect things that you can then give to things, so then you can go murder some more people. Yeah. That's what the game is. Um, or four people the, who then get murdered by more abstruse means. Right, right. And then you go murder those people. Mm-hmm. That's the- <laughs> or someone orders you to murder them. Yes. That happens yes. a couple of times. Yep. Um, but but you also get these like deep and rich backstories just through kind of listening to these audio diaries, which are... Uh, I mean, you can skip. Like, except for... Uh, well, you're required to pick up like two audio diaries in the game, maybe three, just to get codes that you yeah. need to, you know, or uh, like the the formula, like you like at, in Langford's lab, you yes, uh, open up a, a painting, you open up a safe using a code, and then you get this one audio diary which gives you the formula you yes. need to create the um, the solution what, that stops the poison. The sol- um, stops the poison. Yeah. So you're required to pick up that one. But other than that, you don't, like, you know, that, that's, that just sort of activates the quest, right? Yeah. You have to pick that up, and, you, like, it'll autoplay when you do it. Mm-hmm. And then, like, later on, there's a bit in um, Olympus Heights where, like, there's a code you need, and I can't, you could probably hack that, though. You could mm-hmm. probably hack it. You could probably hack it, yeah. I, there are not um, many that are essential. Yeah, so, so, I mean, literally, you could walk through the entire game and pick up, like, maybe three that you're, like, literally required to pick mm-hmm. up. I um, mean, it may not even be that many. Um, it might be literally one. <laughs> that would be an interesting playthrough. You know, play Bioshock with picking up one audio diary. <laughs> right. So you you'd be <laughs> because very you're so confused. programmed to just you're so programmed to just pick them up automatically. Yeah, right? yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> but the only way that you really understand what's going on is through the texture that is provided in the world through listening to the audio diaries. Yeah. And so many of them are. Um, kind of character based and they're based on uh, like you get the sense of the the reality you get the sense of the reality of this character Um, and I'll admit I kind of missed it on the first couple of playthroughs like it took me a while to really kind of put together her story that the same girl who was saying I was stood up by Ryan and literally one of the first audio diaries you pick up Um, I was stood up by Ryan and I'm sitting here alone at the bar and then like the revolution happens behind her is the same person who, like, by the time you get to the Apollo Square, and by the time you're kind of picking up these, uh, like, I, it's, it might even be literally the last audio diary you pick up. Um, she's talking about, I'm going to be a part of the revolution, and then she ends up being killed. Like, you literally, like, search her body if you, yeah. if you sort of get the context <laughs> of that. You, know, you literally find her body, and you search it, and you find the audio diary on her yeah. body. And you follow her all the way through followed her all the way through but it's it's such a if you're sort of like um focused on just the narrative if you're focused just on okay i've got to do this i've got to do that i've got to go shoot some people i've got to you know like process through the thing that the game is telling me that i must do which is kill splicers and like collect <laughs> atom and collect money and collect ammo etc uh-huh. it's entirely possible to miss all of that yep. and i think that's <laughs> Kind of the point that they're mm-hmm. that they're kind of going for, like that's that's something that comes back a lot um, to some degree in Bioshock too, but certainly in Infinite, there are you know like there, there are whole like storylines which are only told like there are characters you never meet, there are yeah. characters who have a real impact on the narrative, have no real impact on you as a person that you meet and who have entire stories that only exist in audio diary format. Yeah, and there's right. so much easier to miss in Infinite as well, just because of the nature of the world. You know, Columbia is so much more disparate than Bioshock is, and there are so many areas that are actually optional in Infinite that you can miss them so easily. I mean, we talked about uh, Diane McClintock, that's her name. Diane McClintock. Diane, yes. Yeah. I mean, we talked about Fort Frolic, and I think it would be, a, again, it would have been a really interesting move if, um, you know, you had the option to hack the gate that mm. got you into the bathosphere in Fort Frolic, and you just skipped that entire just skipped level. It, yeah, just left it. Just skip. Why not? <laughs> no, fuck you, Sandra Cohen. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to I'm not, I'm playing, not playing your, your shit. I'm not games. playing your game. Yeah. I'm just going to walk right through this because literally, you walk into Fort Frolic. There's a door on the other side of the room. Uh-huh. You walk to it. 
And then there's the bathosphere. That's, That's what right. you're supposed to do in the game. And then Sander Cohen takes you off on his, like, I've got people I need you to kill. His <laughs> magical <laughs> mystery tour, yeah, right? <laughs> but I've got to say, I, he, he is my favorite character in the game, and that is my favorite area of the game. It's so much fun. I think the reason I like, I respond to it is because it, it plays into my horror video gaming roots, basically. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of horror video games in general. And that, along with the medical pavilion, is probably the most sincere area area in terms of it's just balls out horror my um that's my favorite level because that's where i get wrench jockey too ah. um, <laughs> of course and you know there's a moment there's a moment <laughs> in that game where you like you put the last of the uh photos up in uh-huh. his little tap low yeah. and then he sends it's 20 it's i counted them uh, <laughs> 20 splicers he sends after you and at that point if you enabled, if you've taken all your research and you do, you don't even have to use, like, you can literally just hit these people in the head with a wrench. <laughs> that is <laughs> glorious. Um, Mac Titties playthrough, which I which I uh, mentioned to you before, uh-huh. it does exactly that. And uh, that video, he calls it the wrench dance. And this is kind of when I get, like, piled on by, like, stupid Nazis on Twitter, uh-huh. and then they just decide to, like, let me respond to them. I kind of think of that as the wrench dance. The wrench I'm, dance. <laughs> yeah. I'm and I'm hitting you. Like my wife will tell you that I had like for a lot of, for a long time, whenever it was, uh, you know, I feel like I really need to go and just bash this person in the head with a wrench. And I'm not saying like uh, I'm not a viscerally violent person. Um, it's a little like um, this is a this is a person who is uh, deeply deeply problematic who uh, uh-huh. deserves to be uh, taken out um, with a with a wrench in Bioshock. <laughs> I it's love like, it. It's like it's a it's our version of it in Minecraft, right? In Bioshock. Right, right. <laughs> like, there's this mass of like internet trolls who have uh-huh. decided to bring their Nazi bullshit into my world. Uh-huh. But I have wrench jockey too. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway. Yeah. So we should not well. talk about we should not talk about like visceral violence uh, on this podcast. <laughs> I don't well no, I, I don't know. Games. I mean in this video games. Yeah, in this particular instance, I mean it is part of the themes, isn't it? It's well, it's yeah, it. it's inescapable, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but oh man, um, unless there's anything else that you'd like to talk about, guys, shall we draw it to a close there? I, I mean, the only other thing I wanted to mention very briefly is how much I enjoyed my last playthrough when I discovered the, um, I can't remember what it's called, but you know, like the comedian plasmid? And that thing where you just stop oh, moving. it's so much stuff. fun. I've been oh, playing yeah. at the moment. Uh, I love it. They just transformed my play. I was like, oh my god, I've just run around, because I'm always getting chased by people, because yeah, I'm right. so, my age is terrible. I'm just run around the corner and just stand still, and they can't and see And they can't you. see like, you, yeah. This changes everything! <laughs> this, this is, this is the, uh, you get that by researching the Houdini splicers. That's it. And yeah. I will literally take every fucking photograph. And show, <laughs> like, I get that the instant it's available for me, I... I turn it on the instant I have it, uh-huh. and I never, ever, ever take it away. Yeah. And Un- unless I'm trying to do something with the security cameras, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and um, I want them to notice me because, like, oh, I'm just gonna stand here and be quiet in front of a security camera that literally can't see me. Yeah. That's uh, not particularly helpful. But uh, so then I have to go turn it off. But um, no, no, I that is that is one of the most useful tonics in the game. Yeah. Again. We could go through and do, um, uh, you know, we, we could talk uh, for hours about, like, particular <laughs> styles. The, the only other thing I did was, did you guys, when I was out, did you guys talk about, the, did you actually talk about the camera mechanic? Because that is the other thing about the game that I think is so deeply weird and I love about Bioshock. Is the idea that one of the things, one of the weapons you get is not a weapon at all, it's a camera. Oh, the camera, the research camera. We, the we more did that. Because it. yeah. it's just such a weird, like, mechanic. It's but it's such a really strange, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's fantastic. And it does change your approach to car. I mean, obviously, again, you use the weapon wheel as a pause button, mm-hmm. so that helps you manage it as a... But I just... The, the fact that as soon as I got it, I spent the next... Certainly, most of the next third of the game where my default weapon was the camera. Uh-huh. Because right. I wanted to... 
the lot with a photo and then switch to something to kill. I just, it's just such a bonkers idea. It's, um, it's a mechanic right. that uh, it sort of demonstrates its pedigree because that's actually a derivation of something that exists in System Shock 2. Uh, in in System Shock <laughs> 2, what you can do is you can, when a, whenever you kill enemies, very often they will have a particular organ on them or something that you can then take and you can use certain chemicals that are littered around the play area to research it. And every time you complete a research uh, cycle, it will give you a long, long, long blurb of narrative about what you've learned from your dissections and whatnot, but it will also give you a certain benefit against the enemy. Huh. So it's the okay. same thing. They yeah, just well, that's the, it in the, in so the literally camera. like the spider splicer organs, yes. which are like health kits. Very that's a, yeah, like that's that. interesting. <laughs> yeah, very much like that. But they've they've just made it a little bit more dynamic. I mean, I I really like it in System Shock Two, but it is bloody cumbersome because you all need right. to you need to notify on the map on the mini map where all of the chemical storage rooms are. And you have to get a chemical manifest so that you know what chemicals are in there, so you have the right chemicals to research the right organs, mm. which can be problematic. Yeah. It's a much more succinct system in Bioshock, where you can just snap yeah. the camera. But I just, and I love the way you get bonus points for action shots, you get bonus points mm -hmm. if there's more than one creature in the oh, shot, all of that kind of it's, stuff. It's kind of it's, a mini game, isn't it? In it is, itself, yeah, it's another mini know? game, yeah. And so it encourages you to, like, put yourself in more danger yep. to uh -huh. take the photos. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like, well, yeah. I mean, there's a particular spot, again, I, I know this game too well, I have <laughs> There's a particular spot where right after you come into Langford's lab in Arcadia, uh -huh. um, where uh, you kind of walk out, and all of the splicers have decided that you're the reason, yes. that because Ryan has told them what well, you're the reason, that, uh, <laughs> that this is happening to them. Uh -huh. right. And so you get these three thuggish splicers who are just running full bore at you uh -huh. to like hit you and kill you know, to try to kill you. But they come at you with enough distance that you can literally get like three of them in frame at any given time. Yeah. And this is literally the moment where I usually complete my thuggish splicer <laughs> research. <laughs> because I've been taking photos obsessively throughout the entire time. Like, I barely buy things in vending machines in my uh -huh. playthroughs anymore. Like, but the one thing I will buy is there are like specific spots where I have to buy film because yeah. I use so much of it in that like sort of like, um, Neptune's Bounty and Arcadia level, uh -huh. um, and then I just buy enough where I don't have to ever worry about it again, right? <laughs> um, but like, I, I that's that's the level at which I've gotten to is like I don't even buy things from vending machines. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, like, I was sitting with, like, $500 for the entire <laughs> run of the game. Yeah. But no, no, so, so, I'm taking, uh, so I'm taking the photos, and that's literally where I get my, uh, my, my thuggish research splicer research is done. Uh -huh. And you get that, like, increased damage, and then the three pluses. Yeah, yeah. And then you just hit them in the face with yeah, the Yeah, you don't even bother, do you? I mean... <laughs> It's done, you yeah. know, and they're literally sitting there and they're running at you, and they're like, "I'm so mad," and it's like, "Oh, you're done." You're, you're done. done. Right. It's such a such a like you know uh, power trip at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it makes you a little sorry that the game didn't come out just a little later during a pati during particular sort of um, when internet cultures were really blossoming. Because you can imagine that there would be an extra mechanic in the game whereby you could actually save the photographs in an album and maybe upload oh, yeah, them yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which would have been yeah. great fun, wouldn't it? That would have been a great fun sort of little communal aspect of it. Right. Although it is nice also that you get the. Um... That the that the photos are um, like sepia toned, that mm -hmm. they're not so, oh, it's so really great. high quality yeah. photos. It's very kind of of that of that moment that you get to see them once, you get to see them for a couple of seconds, and they go away. And I think that's yeah. a interesting dynamic. Like it doesn't really matter what the photos look like, no. although it would be nice to get to kind of go back and, and have and a look. Yeah, and see if you could uh, get particular compositions and particular shots. It could be an entire subculture of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you have actually reminded me of one of my very, very, very few kind of moments in the game where I was like, oh, that's a bit gamey, which is like, I mean, I understand you have you have ammunition limits and you have uh -huh. a set number of weapons, but the first time I went to search a body and it said wallet is full, I was just uh -huh. like, 
Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. $500 is like fit uh-huh. in my wallet. What, what is this bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also carrying a machine gun. Exactly. A grenade launcher. launcher. A, exactly. a chemical thrower. Mm-hmm. Like, what? A pistol. I mean, there is this kind of thing of like, in any kind of realistic thing, I'm literally yeah. walking around with like 100 pounds of like equipment on me. <laughs> right, right. And, I mean, you know, 12 grenades, 12 high <laughs> grenades, 12, <laughs> 12 rocket propelled grenades, 180 rounds of three different types of yeah. machine ammo, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, well, I'm walking artillery, but like $501. Yeah, yeah. stuff the moment. Like, the most grizzled army veteran could not carry around in their backpack, you know, it's, it's insane. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's taken a step them further. Them instantly. I can literally yeah. switch between them in a like at a moment's notice. You know? uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. It, it, that, that's where the kind of the, the reality breaks down a bit, yeah. which um, do do something with in in, in infinite. And I think we'll, when we do uh, talk about that, I think that will be really interesting to kind of get into yeah, how that changes the dynamic of the way you kind of treat your weapons. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I've yet to play infinite, so I'm looking forward to that. Oh, but, yeah. really? One of the, yeah. Oh. <laughs> you can upgrade the weapons as you like. There are little like you have six weapons and uh, twelve. Um, each one can have two upgrades. Right. And there are only like twelve power to the people upgrade stations in the game. So you can go through and you can upgrade every weapon, you know, to to its maximum thing. And again, if you're a wrench player, then you basically use like okay, there are like two weapons that I actually use at all, yeah. and you just kind of upgrade randomly. <laughs> Or, you know, what I'm using in this particular level or whatever. Um, but um, it is interesting that you get, like, little visual changes in terms yeah. of the, the weapons look. Um, oh, I love that. Board, which is cool. Um, but also, you, you do get to you do get to pick. You do get to kind of kind of choose, like, kind of what you what you what you're going to be using. Yeah. Um, and it is something that you just like. You it, it does reward you for sort of like looking at your environment. <laughs> as you kind of play through the game and a lot of the game does just like both in just sort of a mechanical like the game gets better and easier like you get more stuff you can use if you just kind of look in every crate um you know but also you know, <laughs> looking at the environment gives you both sort of story clues it gives you like all the posters and all the and, and everything but it also gives you like stuff that's going to help you like oh let's see, increase your weapon damage um, yeah yeah, no, yeah. it's really, yeah, it really does reward exploration on every level, doesn't it? It's and really engagement, good. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's one of those games that really does reward you for not sort of playing it passively. You know, not looking, not being distracted by things whilst you're playing it. It wants to immerse you. Yeah, it, it wants to yeah. give you an experience, which I, I really appreciate. Oh, absolutely, yeah, it's a joy. Well, guys, I think we All may right. have... Well, I don't think we've exhausted that one. I think Dan no. could go for another couple of hours, to be perfectly honest. But for now, I think... Shall we draw that one to a close? I yes. think so. Maybe maybe Bioshock 1 Part 2 is what we need to do next I, time. I'm up for that. I'm up for that. But um, And also, I mean, Bioshock 2 and Infinite at some point. Definitely. Oh, yeah, definitely. No, no, definitely. Um, so, guys, we're gonna thank do, you. We're going to do, do so Bioshock much. Medical Pavilion. Bioshock Neptune County. <laughs> to every floor. <laughs> Do a, a dissection of every floor, my god. That would be good fun. I'm sure someone's done it. I'm sure it's been done on the internet somewhere. Or but uh, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for yeah, coming on. Thank you so, so much for inviting me. I will come back anytime. It's, a, it's been a pleasure, Daniel. And by the, is there anything, guys, that you would like to come out? You want to go ahead, Daniel? I do a podcast if you're interested, not so much in libertarians and objectivists, but um, Nazis, neo-Nazis, alt-right shitheads, dissident right. I do a podcast because I don't speak German, um, because I don't speak German, um, but also I've been listening to Nazi podcasts for three years, and some of them want to kill me, and others are just very mad at me, and none of them like me very much. <laughs> Um, but I talk about their rhetoric and uh, all the propaganda that they produce and the internal bullshit dynamics, yeah. all the very funny things that they do to one another many times um, <laughs> on that show. Um, so, yeah, I don't speak German. com. You can also find me on Twitter at Daniel Lee Harper, where I'm mostly talking about not Bioshock and video games, uh-huh. but about um, terrible dynamics of um, uh, internal Nazi 
bullshit. Um, and also, um, apparently, Democratic primary politics, which has been making me angry lately. So, right. you know. <laughs> Links below, by the way, ladies and gents. Um, oh, I don't speak uh, German. Is compulsive. Yep. Absolutely. Is it not? Yeah, absolutely. no, absolutely compulsive. I mean, what I, one of the things I, 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 when I first, when Jack first pointed me your way, Daniel. I was I was a little wary because I thought this is going to depress me massively. This is going to make me really angry and really annoyed. And actually, it didn't make it didn't depress me. It didn't make me angry and annoyed because of the way you present the material. I mean, it is incredibly dark and incredibly worrisome, but you present it in a way that is palatable, that that it can be endured. And I marathoned about thirty episodes of the thing. <laughs> that's not that's not what anyone should do. People think that, and I'm like, no. That is not the way to do this. It's just compulsive. I, I found it no, compulsive. I, understand. I don't blame you, but like, you know. That's, that's not the way you should do things, unhealthy. says the guy who spent three years listening to Nazi podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> three years, 30 hours a week at least. See? Uh, so do as I say, not as I do, right? I've, I've listened to thousands of hours of a podcast called The Daily Showa. Just to. Wow. Um, now that, that I don't know how. I, I, I admire yeah. your fortitude. I and your forbearance because it would drive me to utter self-mutilating distraction <laughs> well yeah I mean I think any time you want to come on here and chat shit about video games as a break you know yeah, you're, right. you're welcome please do please yeah. do yeah, yeah, no. So, but if you want to know anything about Nazis, that's the that's the way to go. Oh, and yeah. uh, also, yes, thank you for the for the kind words, and I I do appreciate that, and I get that. It, it's actually something that I like think very seriously about, like how to present this material, yeah. mm-hmm. and how to like kind of explain it to people in ways. So I do. It's a weird tone we have to <laughs> like reach in terms of like both making it sort of funny and entertaining, but not to in any way kind of, dist- of detract from the horror of kind of what we're talking about. Oh, right. yeah. So, and so it's a real, um, it's a real balancing act. And I think some episodes we do better than others. I'm my own kind of worst critic on some of that. Um, but yeah, no. The the goal is to. Um, one of the best comments I ever got was someone who said, um, you know, I couldn't even bear to look at this because I knew it was going. I knew it was growing. I knew it was a thing that was existing in my society, but I couldn't bear to look at it. Yeah. And after listening to a couple of your episodes, it gave me the strength to go and like look at this for myself. Yeah. And that's like that's the moment where it's like that is actually the goal. That's that what you're, what, yeah. You're, you're, like the whole point. Like the whole point stone, is to yeah? give you the ability to understand it for yourself and to look at it and to examine like as terrible as these people are and again I've spent like thousands of hours listening to genocidal racists Mm -hmm. like describe their plans for world domination through making making you know anti-semitism funny Mm -hmm. um it's also something that uh these people are absolutely ridiculous and defeatable if uh, people just have a better understanding. So, anyway, sorry, uh, had to no, have that. No, no, it's a bio shot conversation, but uh, yeah. it is massively appreciated. The entire absolutely. endeavor is massively appreciated. Yeah. And also, I, again, I say, ladies and gentlemen, well worth a listen to. Yeah. Kids, uh, I know I w- you've got stuff. Oh God, I'm not just. But before yeah. we do, I just want to say, Daniel's um, Daniel also didn't mention he does have a Patreon, and if mm. having listened to a few episodes of I Don't Speak German, you'd like to help support it financially, you should absolutely go and do that. Yeah, um, again, links below, ladies and yeah. gentlemen, links um, below. So yeah, please do that because I, I echo everything that's been said. It's a it's a fantastic show. It's for me. Uh, so by the time you hear this, My Life in Horror Volume One crowdfunder will have completed. I've got about ten hours to go on mm-hmm. that, so that that'll be done. But the good news yep. is that means the book will be coming out because the yep. crowdfunder is has been successful. As um, I've been keeping an eye on it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. God. Yes. Me too. Uh, if you like checking things, I can recommend starting a crowdfunder because you'll find <laughs> you just check everything every sort of ten seconds. But yeah. So that's that's great. That's funded. So what that means is that My Life in Horror Volume One will be coming out in uh, ebook and mass market paper back and possibly a regular hardback edition as well and those things will all be happening i think for april is the plan may at the latest uh the the editor's already working on the text so that's really exciting i can confirm that my novella with horrific tales which may have gained a title today but (laughs) may not so i can't quite confirm it although I, I like where we've got to with it that is now in the proofread stage so again that's scheduled for a StokerCon release uh, so if you want a, a pulp horror novella about uh, a song that ends the world 
Ooh. which is all I want to say for the moment. Okay. That will uh, that will be coming at you. And uh, voices with the uh, Black Shot books, uh, short short story collection, about eight tales collected together in a very small kind of slim pocket paperback edition. Uh, all first person narratives, some new stories, some old. Um, my personal favourite is a new short story entitled Pulling Teeth. And uh, that's ah. that'll be out. Yes, and that'll be out again for StokerCon. See, so mm-hmm. loads of stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Abs- again, ladies and gentlemen, there will be links below for all relevant materials. Thank you once again, guys. It's been an absolute blast. So glad we got to talk about this. Absolutely. And we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll set a date. Let's come back for come back for Bioshock Two. And, oh uh, my God! Yes, and so kids, you you have to play Infinite. <laughs> I'm gonna. No, I'm gonna play yeah. it. It's on the list. To give you. A th- <laughs> <laughs> to give you context for the, I'm not even going to say anymore. Just, just, just play it. Yeah, we, I'll we play. just, just end it here. Yeah, just yeah, end it yeah. Here. that's fine. Kid, you got to play. You got to play on for that. Yeah, yeah. done. I will. Excellent. Right. Okay. Bye, bye, guys. Talk soon, guys. Bye. <laughs>